All right. Well, I show us right at seven o'clock, and I know that uh, at least one budget committee member has indicated that he's likely to be just a little bit late. Jacob, let us know. Um, and we are also, I think, missing. No, maybe I think actually, let's see. We're, we're only missing Herb, Herb right? Yeah, Herb. I, just, I just reached out to him. Okay. But let's go ahead. We definitely have a quorum. I think we should call the meeting to order and begin. So uh, I guess note attendance and we'll note anybody who arrives late as well. Noted. All right. So uh, there's a couple of things we're going to do to get the ball rolling tonight. We do have a couple of housekeeping items that we'll take care of. And then the first order of business really after that will be to elect a chair and vice chair who will uh, carry that role throughout this budget committee process uh, through the end of this budget cycle. So uh, regarding item two, discussion of budget committee procedural rules, et cetera. So everybody hopefully had a chance to take a look at the two items that were attached to board book. One of them is titled roles and Responsibility responsibilities of the budget committee. This is a one pager produced by OSBA that outlines the rules and roles and responsibilities, excuse me, of budget committee members. I didn't plan to read the whole thing out loud, but essentially it sort of outlines what the budget committee's purview is, what is not within its purview. Uh, you know, we don't change staffing levels, salary schedules or negotiate salary contracts, for example. Um, but we do provide guidance and direction and oversight uh, per Oregon statutes that define how these committees operate, et cetera. So with that, I do want to just pause for a moment and ask if, you know, everybody's had an opportunity to look at it and if anybody has any questions regarding the role of the budget committee. Hopefully at this point, you've had a chance to uh, have that uh, answered. Everybody good? All right. And um, also welcome tonight to uh, Astrid and Matt, who are new members this year. And uh, you know, congrats, happy to have you on the team. All right, next up, we do also have a, a decorum uh, operating agreement that we approved July 27th of last year. And it is our expectation that all members will uh, you know, follow that decorum document. So uh, you know, the chair will be responsible for making sure that points of order are uh, taken. Well, actually, anybody can call point of order, but the chair is responsible for sort of uh, adjudicating that and making sure people are following this decorum agreement. Have you all had a chance to take a look at it, everybody? Good with the decorum agreement? Perfect. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's on board book. Everybody's going to be held to it. Thank you. All right. With that, we're going to move straight into the process for electing a chair and a vice chair. And we're going to follow the process very similar to last year. We're going to do this in three parts. We are going to first solicit nominations. We will then have discussion as necessary about said nominations. And then on the third step, we will proceed to a vote. It will take eight votes to elect a chair or a vice chair. If there are three or four candidates, we may not reach that on the first vote, at which point we'll have more discussion and proceed until we, we get a majority vote. I'm getting a lot of feedback and I don't know where it's coming from. Do you all hear that or is it just me? Mm -hmm. We can hear the feedback. Yeah. All right. So just as a reminder, Zoom calls are painful and frustrating, but keep muted unless you're actively speaking. It'll probably help. Thank you. Okay. So any questions on the process that I've outlined regarding how we're going to go about this. Okay. With that, I will open the floor up to nominations. Debbie will keep track of it. 
Again, we're not gonna move and second on nominations. If anybody's nominated, the only question I'm gonna ask is are you willing? And if the answer is yes, you'll be one of the uh, candidates that we'll vote on later. Jonathan, I'd, I'd yeah. like to nominate uh, Peter Matska for, for budget committee chair. Thank you, Janet. Peter, are you willing? I'll accept the nomination. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Other nominations, anybody? Jonathan, is it okay if people want to do it and they self-nominate? Absolutely. Uh, I was going to nominate uh, McCollum for uh, chair. Uh, that was my plan before being nominated, but I appreciate the nomination, Janet. So. Nicole, are you willing? I'll try, yes. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Any other nominations? Okay, we have two nominations, Peter and Nicole. Uh, this is the time where we have a chance to discuss it, share any thoughts or concerns before we move on to uh, the vote that Debbie will call here in a little bit. And both candidates, by the way, will receive an independent vote. And um, the first one to receive eight, I guess, is going to Uh, I'll just chime in a little. I, I would like to see both the chair and vice chair um, be a part of the planning process of the agenda, um, if possible. So regardless of, of who is elected or appointed, um, I would like to see both uh, folks work with the chair of the board, Jonathan, um, if, if they are committee members in this case. But uh, it's just my quick point there. That's a great point. And actually, the, the chair and vice chair of the budget committee will be directly involved, I suspect, in setting that. Actually, as board chair, I'll be loose, more loosely in, involved rather than directly. So uh, yeah. but you're right, Peter, the, the chair and vice chair will definitely be involved. Yeah. And, and last year, I was vice chair and, and was not involved. And, and that was not really established. But I, I would like whomever is vice chair, I would like equally involved with the chair, if, if so, picked or chosen, either way. Right, great point. And yeah, we we have done that this year regarding board chair and vice chair working with the superintendent. And I think following suit on this makes complete sense. Okay. I think unless there's any additional comments, you know, raise your hand or just speak up at this point if you have anything else you'd like to add before we call the vote. Okay, Debbie, if you would, please, uh, doing the, the votes. All right, this vote is for Peter Matska. I'll start with Jacob Klotfelter. No. Matthew. Yes. Peter. No. Hurt. No. Nicole. Yes. Astrid. Yes. Robin. No. Janet. Yes. Tom? Yes. Jonathan? No. Lori? Yes. Shelly? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. That's eight yeses and five noes. 
Very good. Congrats, Peter. At this point, we'll do the exact same process for vice chair. And once we complete this process, I'll be handing over the reins to you, Peter. So, uh, but we'll go ahead and finish this part of the process first. So we'll accept nominations right now for vice chair. I nominate I would Nicole. like to nominate Nicole. Yes. <laughs> I'm with McCall. Yes. I think I heard her nominate Nicole, so I think that's in the books. Um, any other nominations? Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and go straight to the vote. Probably, um, I didn't. We already had Nicole up for chair. So. Okay. Jacob. Yes. Matthew. Yes. Peter. Yes. Kurt. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Astrid. Yes. Robin. Yes. Janet. Yes. Tom. Aye. Jonathan. Yes. Lori. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Shelly. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. It's unanimous. Congrats. All right. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is Peter, you will essentially take the gavel, the virtual gavel from me and take over as chair and that'll proceed through the rest of tonight and through all subsequent board meetings. Um, again, congrats and thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, Nicole, I, I, I made that comment because I think it's important that both uh, the chair and, and vice chair both um, contribute to the agenda and, and work with the administration, Scott and, and Jonathan both. I think um, we can hopefully uh, come up with a, a plan and, and uh, move forward. So again, thank you for your votes. Um, it's a little different in the uh, realm of uh, Zoom, but uh, I guess we're going to move forward. And uh, the next action item on the board is, uh, or I guess not action, but the budget message. And that's from Superintendent Scott Drew. And uh, Scott, I I've seen you in a few meetings and welcome and I'm glad to finally see you smiling and get a wave and say <laughs> hi. So, so I guess, Scott, uh, you're, uh, you're up next. Well, thank you, Peter. And Peter, thank you for your service. I uh, look forward to working with you as well. Um, and welcome, everyone. And thank you for your time tonight for volunteering to serve on this committee and work through the budget process with us. And before I get into my message, I just want to give a huge shout out to uh, Steve Nielsen, our director of finance, and, and Steve's team, uh, who have just been working round the clock to, to prepare uh, a plan uh, for us in, in working with Steve on, on the budget message that I'll give. Um, I think you'll find that it's very detail oriented and, and tries to paint as clear a picture as possible in a very, very unique budget environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and read for you uh, my budget message. And I've practiced a couple times trying to hold up a piece of paper and speak into Zoom. So if you'll bear with me, I appreciate your grace. And I'll go ahead and start that. So good evening, members of the budget committee. Tonight, we present to you the 21-22 proposed budget. As is typically the case for years beginning a new biennium, as of this date, there remain a number of unknowns that we can say with certainty will affect this budget. This fact coupled, coupled with the uncertainty surrounding enrollment numbers for next year, due to the many changes in service forced on us by the COVID-19 pandemic, means that we face not just a single year of uncertainty in our future, but rather that the next several years remain likewise uncertain. In a few minutes, our business director, Steve Nielsen, will go into greater detail 
um, uh, about these finances. However, I'd like to take this opportunity to run you through a high level overview of the budget situation. It's impossible to discuss our budget or budgeting process without first recalling our strategic plan. Our budget ties directly to the goals of that plan, which are number one, each student is on track to graduate every year. Goal two, each student has the social and emotional learning skills to navigate their world. Goal three, each school facility reflects the excellence of education in our district. In line with our first and second goals, we're committed to ensuring every child in our district has the opportunity and support they need to make up any learning gaps they've experienced as a result of the pandemic. While I'll discuss this in greater detail further in this presentation, I can summarize the state of our budget with this. We fully expect a budget gap this year. However, federal ESSER funding will be used as a shock absorber to help us cover that gap as we move towards a full recovery. We will also use alternative funding sources like ESSER and SIA to provide flexibility in our teaching and learning practices in order to cover the education gaps we know exist for many of our students. Our goal is to help our students climb this mountain rather than be stuck carrying it with them for the rest of their lives. OSBA and many other bodies have pegged a statewide K-12 budget of $9.6 billion as the current service level budget. This number represents the amount of funding needed to operate schools at their current service levels over the coming biennium. At this time, both the governor's budget and the co-chair's budget sit at 9.1 billion. Every million dollars in the state school fund represents $1,000 per year for the Silver Falls School District in the 21 through 23 biennium. While it is very possible that the actual state school fund appropriation will change from the current $9.1 billion number, I will be blunt. We do not expect the state school fund to hit the $9.6 billion target for current service level funding in the 21-23 biennium. However, the final state school fund allocation remains unknown. Another unknown and one that is a new concern for our district has to do with student enrollment. As many of you already know, school districts are funded based on their enrollment. Many districts around the state deal with fluctuating enrollment numbers and therefore fluctuating funding on a regular basis. Silver Falls School District has been very fortunate for many years to have had steady or slightly increasing enrollment and thus steady or increasing funding levels. The pandemic has changed all that. At our lowest point this year, enrollment dropped by just over 10% or 400 students. As we've increased in-person school services, enrollment has slowly started to recover. That's a positive sign, but we have a long way to go. School funding is always based on either the current year's enrollment numbers or the previous year's numbers, whichever is higher. At this point, we believe it is safe to assume that as we resume five day per week in-person instruction next year, our enrollment numbers will be higher than they are this year. This means that our funding will be based on next year's enrollment. What we don't know and what truly no one knows at this point in time is whether or not we will see a return to our pre-pandemic enrollment numbers or if we will ultimately fall short of that target as families who have sought alternative education options over the past 14 months remain with those options long-term. Finally, funding for the two years in the biennium is not level. Rather, we are funded in the first year of the biennium at 49% of the total budget, and we receive 51% of the total budget in the biennium's second year. All of this together means that while expenses are going up in the coming year, revenue is either flat or going down and absolutely will be going down if our enrollment does not recover well. Throughout the pandemic, we have understandably had very low costs for substitute teachers, as well as for transportation and certain other costs. Furthermore, as positions have been vacated for one reason or another, 
we have largely left those positions unfilled. While this is not a true hiring freeze, as we have hired some positions where needed, our focus on reducing expenses ensures that we are saving money through attrition and we continue to engage in that strategy. Oregon School Investment Account Dollars, or SIA, have allowed us to expand services and programs through targeted spending of money earmarked for those purposes. This funding, it, this funding is an additional revenue source that must be used in specific ways and in alignment with our strategic plan and school improvement plans. Teaching and Learning Director Leslie Roach will speak to this in greater detail later this evening. Additionally, programs such as the Federal Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER, provide an injection of needed funds during this difficult time. SFSD's ESSER II allocation for this year is $1.43 million. And the ESSER III allocation, which came out just last Friday, is $3.2 million. A portion of these funds will help the funding gap and act as a shock absorber in 2021-2022. In these funds will also address learning gaps, provide additional social and emotional supports, bolster technology, provide for further ventilation improvements, and other COVID-related safety needs. At this point, you may be wondering what impact these factors will have on schools. I can tell you several things for sure and we can make some educated guesses about future scenarios. First of all, I want you to know that we are 100% committed to protecting jobs in the short term, even if it means positions look a little bit different than they have in the past. This will always be in line with the goals of our strategic plan. We know we have a significant amount of deferred learning from this year. In line with our goal that each student is on track to graduate every year, there will be significant opportunities for teachers and support staff to engage in non-traditional teaching and learning roles in the coming year. This may look like before or after school support sessions, summer school, or other creative opportunities. I don't wanna give you the impression that we know exactly what this will look like at this juncture. Rather importantly, you, it's rather, rather you understand that in a situation where, for example, a school's enrollment might be low enough that we have a teacher surplus in that school, we do not have any plans to eliminate that position next year. Rather, we would look creatively to find other opportunities for our excellent teachers and incredible support staff to continue to serve students while our district and our state economies recover from the effects of the pandemic. Now, in the event that our enrollment numbers don't recover for several years, then certainly there will have to be some more difficult conversations. However, given that this remains an unknown, we choose the path of prudent optimism. Outside of the conversation around simply the operational budget and in line with our strategic goal, each school facility reflects the excellence of education in our district. Our long range facility planning committee continues to meet and in fact will continue to meet into the next school year. The average age of our facilities is over 70 years old. And we know that we have several significant facility repairs, upgrades, or replacements in the future. There's no reason to dance around the fact that at some point in the future, the SFSD community must approve a bond to perform these activities. We do not yet have a timeline for such a bond. And I want to emphasize here that we will not seek a bond until we've engaged with every possible stakeholder group and every interested community member to discuss these needs, as well as their expectations for what a good use of bond dollars represents for each of our unique school communities. We continue to hear from our community that the goals of our strategic plan represent what they want to see from their school district. We also hear loud and clear the calls to return students to full-time in-person education as soon as possible. We look forward to taking additional steps in that direction and reopening fully in-person next school year. The budget you'll see tonight represents our current best thinking based on both the known knowns and known unknowns present in our current budgeting process. 
And I wanna share my great appreciation for all of you, for your willingness to be here and work through this process with us. And for that, I wanna say thank you again. And uh, Peter, I can go ahead and turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Scott. And um, I, I posted a little comment there in the, the chat, but um, we wanna keep things moving forward. But if there are questions, um, and things that come up, uh, you can put them in the chat. Uh, if it's something for clarification, uh, raise the hand, but um, just uh, we wanna keep things moving forward and uh, also open. So the next uh, up, if there is nothing questioning or, or oh, Shelly, I see a hand raised and raising the hand is good too. Yeah, I, I only have a limited screen in front of me, so I have to scroll up and down. But Shelly, yes. Oh, okay. It, it kind of gives a visual, um, and it, it kind of helps a little bit. But um, so I, so Peter, I do have a quick question. I did take some notes down here when Scott was talking, um, and I have several questions that I wanted to ask him for clarification or to to answer. Um, can we have a, a, a possible question time with Scott and then move on to the next um, agenda item or do one we of the things we could do in? one of the things we could do Shelley is I think mm -hmm. I think uh, when after Steve had an opportunity to present uh, the full financials that couple mm -hmm. my statement I think will may answer a lot of questions okay like we can wait till then or sure sounds great just a yeah. suggestion. Yeah, uh, Shelly, if, if that's okay, I mean, I don't want things, if there is a quick question of clarification or something to follow up with, with someone who's presented, but if, if you're um, okay waiting till Steve goes, um, is that okay? It sure is, yeah. Okay, um, but yeah, I don't want a little, yeah, we don't want to get labored down in the questions uh, and, and, and the back and forth, but that's the important part of this process, so. I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity for clarification and um, feel free to step in and speak up when you, you feel there's something needs a little more explanation for okay. yourself. But um, yeah, so let's continue on with uh, Steve. And are you ready, Steve? Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. And good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here and for investing your time in this uh, process. Can everyone hear me okay? Thanks. Uh, just wanted to mention uh, Scott's uh, superintendent's budget message is uh, part of the official proposed budget and will be posted under number four on board book later tonight or in the morning. So you will all have a copy to be able to look at as well. Usually that's uh, not pre-posted as it's uh, unveiled the night of the the meeting. So that's uh, why it's not on there in advance. And I also wanted to thank uh, Derek McElfresh for his help in crafting this document as well. He's uh, um, an outstanding writer and, and it was a, a group effort. So thank you to Derek. Um, yes, I also wanted to echo what Scott said and thank uh, the business services uh, team for all their help in getting this budget together and uh, specifically Sharon Edsel for getting about uh, 80 or 90 percent of the budget loaded into the system uh, for all the details that you see uh, in the budget uh, document. Uh, couldn't, couldn't do it without the group. So uh, I have a, actually a PowerPoint uh, presentation that I'm going to go through uh, and I'll post that tomorrow as well. This is an additional uh, presentation that highlights the budget and some of the key points that Scott has gone over in a little greater detail as well as some notes about the document itself. Before I share my screen with that, I just wanted to say that uh, there are some um, additional supplementary financial materials that were shared the last couple of days under item number six on board book for everyone to see. I find it to be helpful to share as much as we can. And a lot of this material has been shared throughout the year uh, for previous board meetings. Um, for example, our audited complete audited financial statement for fiscal year 2019-20. We've reposted it here. Uh, the, the board financial statement that I'll be sharing with the board on Monday uh, through the month of April for this year. Um, last year's uh, audited revenue and expense detailed uh, summary that went along with the audited financial report. And then also I've included a, 
a PDF of the Oregon Department of Education Program Budget and Accounting Man Manual, affectionately known as PBAM. They update it every two years and uh, every school district in the state um, adheres to the chart of accounts uh, per this, this document. So it gives you some more detail as to uh, what all the funds, functions, objects, uh, how those are broken out, how those are categorized and what some of the methodology is. So uh, these are items that uh, you certainly don't uh, have to look at, but they can uh, be very helpful as you go through this process or at any time during the year. So I will go ahead and share my screen so we could go through the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation here. Sorry, I have three screens going, so I need to figure out which way uh, the, the, the cursor is gonna jump to the next screen here. <laughs> um, there we go, okay. So can everyone see uh, a PowerPoint presentation there on the screen? Okay. All righty. So I'm going to go through the, the budget uh, timeline and process. We've, we've already talked about roles, so we don't need to do that. And then I'm going to get uh, into more detail on the, the current district financial status, background, and, um, and, and more about the budget specifically. And then we'll take a quick walk through the budget document. When I'm done with my presentation, uh, Leslie is going to piggyback on my presentation and give a 10 or 15 minute presentation specifically from teaching and learning and all of the programs that we have. We have, while we have a, a, a pretty dismal state school fund number for our general operating fund, we have a lot of new dollars that have come into play the last few years and then some that are brand new, whether it be the federal stimulus dollars that have just come into play this year. Uh, the, the SIA funds, which started this year as well, and then also Measure 98 dollars, which started a few years ago, high school success specifically, and also some new dollars that uh, just, uh, they just put the application uh, paperwork out for, which is the state statewide funding for summer school this year. So Leslie's gonna cover in greater detail exactly what these programs are and how those funds are being used. So the budget timeline this year, specifically uh, tonight, we 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 kick things off with this this committee's first meeting. Uh, our second meeting is scheduled for for two weeks from tonight at 7 p.m. on the 20th, and uh, we usually try to st strategically place that meeting around the uh, the the uh, state quarterly economic forecast. Uh, so the next state state forecast is due is due out uh, to to the press on Wednesday, May 19th, which will be uh, very timely for us as we proceed uh, with this with this budget process because uh, they are not going to do anything with the state school fund number until they see this next economic forecast. Uh, we do have a third uh, meeting uh, date picked out for June 2nd, and there could be other meetings uh, around that if uh, need be. Uh, but essentially, uh, the budget must be adopted by the board uh, by June 30th. Uh, I believe the June, uh, June board meeting is on Monday the 14th, which would typically be the, the meeting that the uh, approved budget from this committee would be presented to the board for a budget hearing. I don't need to look at that. Okay, financial background. So. This is the bottom line uh, with the budget. Uh, we have state resources that are either flat or going to slightly decline. We don't know the answer to that question yet as the state school fund appropriation is not yet finalized and we don't know exactly what our enrollment return rate will be. Uh, but, but flat is about as good as it's gonna be right now. And we have expenditures that are in increasing. Uh, so our current resources and our current uh, requirements do not align, therefore creating a budget deficit. So uh, Scott mentioned this in his budget message, but um, the first year of the biennium is always uh, more difficult anyway, even without our enrollment issue. 
uh, because they fund the first year at 49% and then the second year in, in 51%. So we'll be going from this fiscal year at a 51% level based on a $9.0 billion budget. And we'll be going to the first year of the new biennium next year at 49% of a $9.1 billion number. So that's really uh, not taking any steps forward. And then we add the enrollment issue. The reason the enrollment issue has not hurt us this year is because we've been able to rely on last year's enrollment. However, next year, uh, if we don't get a full recovery, we will be, uh, uh, depending on funding, even if it is on next year's number, something quite possibly lower than what we saw in 2019-20. Uh, again, we just don't really know what uh, what to expect there. There is some optimism that the state school fund will increase by 200 million, possibly $300 million to, to either 9.3 or $9.4 billion. There's a good track record of getting some movement on that number as we've entered May and June in legislative sessions. If the state uh, economic forecast is uh, as good or better as February's forecast. I think there's a uh, better than a 50-50 chance of that. But in true conservative, uh, uh, conservative nature of budgeting, uh, this budget is based on the $9.1 billion number because that's the only official number that we've seen at this point. I know other districts have taken their budgets and built in a higher number. Salem-Kaiser, for example, released theirs two nights ago and went with the $9.4 billion number, and the Willamette ESD went with 9.3. Right now, our budget sits at 9.1. To reiterate what Scott uh, had in his budget message, the, the math around this is that each $100 million means just over $300,000 in additional state school fund revenue each year of the next biennium. So over $600,000 over the two-year period for each $100 million. So it's, it's a big deal. Sorry, I'm, uh, the cursor's not uh, doing very well here. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, eight-year history on the general fund, uh, ending fund balance. Uh, you can see it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, we gained quite a bit. Uh, between 2015-16 and 2018-19. The thing that I really like to highlight here is it's very important to take a two-year or biennial approach to this number, again, because uh, of the 49%, 51% split. Uh, in the 1719 uh, biennium, so years 1718 and 1819, uh, they funded at 50 50. All other bienniums, they funded at the 4951. Uh, no other uh, biennium illustrates better than last year, our ending fund balance decreased quite a bit uh, in the first year of the current biennium. And this year, uh, by June 30th, 2021, we expect that number. Uh, to get uh, somewhere in between 3.4 and $4 million. Uh, so if you basically look at the, uh, the graph between, um, between this point and this point, that's the biennial period. And that's what I think is important to look at in this, in this particular case. This, the analysis around why the ending fund balance uh, besides the 49-51 split has changed quite a bit in this two-year period, but essentially will recover to a better number by the end of the biennium. Has to do again the fact that the PERS rates went up 4% of payroll uh, July 1st, 2019. Uh, which, which created a, an additional uh, $750,000 per year uh, expense to the general fund. Uh, we had our uh, new teacher uh, contract, uh, our investment in, in our teachers. Uh, we had some additional investment of counseling at the K-8 level, and we did complete uh, a lot of uh, uh, maintenance projects in a, the three-year period leading up to this year. We did have to ratchet that back as we went into this budget period. And then, of course, as we were building the budget last year was just the start of the COVID-19 impacts. 
what's interesting about that is we did incur some some unexpected expenses as we finished last year, which just made that ending fund balance decrease even further. But this year we've actually seen uh, we've we've saved uh, some some money that was budgeted in this year's budget, uh, specifically around substitute teachers. For example, we just have started to see that pick up a little bit with the hybrid model, but it's been uh, pretty much a, a non a non expense uh, for about three quarters of this year, and then uh, transportation and some other costs where we've had to spend more money on supplies, for example, uh, this year than budgeted those have to do with uh, PPE and you know cleaning supplies and those types of things that we can pay for with ESSER dollars or even uh, some of those items we have going through a FEMA reimbursement process. So that's actually going to help our earning fund balance uh, at the end of this year recover even a little bit more than uh, than what we even expected as we were sitting here a year ago. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't have additional pressures though. Our Medicaid funding has been um, severely uh, uh, decreased uh, during this time because some of the services that we're able to bill Medicaid for have uh, uh, haven't looked the same in the virtual environment. Um, so some of those uh, nursing costs, for example, or special needs assistance costs that we're able to fund in Fund 200 may have to be reclassed to the general fund. And then also there's been some additional pressures put on the lunch fund that may need uh, some assistance from the general fund with and, and that that was already an issue to begin with so so there's a lot of things going back and forth there's a lot of timing differences and it's just really important to understand all the factors that are going into uh, the finances and the effect on the ending fund balance this these next three slides can actually be found in the supplementary section of your proposed budget document uh, in, in, the, in the pages labeled with the uh, S's. Uh, these show a five year actual history of revenue and expenses uh, broken down by the major categories uh, in the general fund. And I think they're quite helpful. Uh, these are some of the reports that we're able to get from uh, forecast five. So it has five years of actual history and then FY21 is fiscal year 2021, which is actually the budget for that year. So resources, expenditures, and then we get into uh, my budget notes and assumptions. The next three pages are going to duplicate what is in your budget doc, uh, document on Roman numeral page six. This hopefully provides a, uh, a guide for you as you look through the budget document as to what the assumptions were that went into this budget. We've already talked in great detail about the $9.1 billion biennial budget. Uh, we, we talked about what each $100 million means. So we can skip over that. The enrollment is based on a 75% rate of return on our 400 student drop. So in the back of your budget, there's two pages worth of enrollment information. There's a month by month enrollment summary for this year. So you could see the drop. And now that we're back into the hybrid model, the last two or three months, we've started to see the trend reverse in a positive direction and we've gained some students back. We still have a ways to go. I think it's still down close to 9%. But uh, we went very conservative with the SSF number and the enrollment number. It's hard to say. You know, it may, may be something slightly less than that, but we just don't know. We've talked about the general fund ending fund balance. We're depending on a slight use of those reserves. If, if the ending fund balance comes in at 3.9%, million, I've reserved $3.3 million uh, by the end of next year. So that's a $600,000 use of previous year's resources. And then the big one has to do with the federal stimulus dollars. I have, uh, I believe, four pages again in the supplementary section that does a really good job of explaining 
ESSER dollars and the three different stimulus uh, packages in which they came from. Um, actually, there's quite a bit on the ODE website, which is where some of this came from. And there's actually a side-by-side -side comparison of ESSER 1, 2, and 3 and the allowable uses. But essentially, the first stimulus package that dates back quite a ways to, to last spring and summer. Um, and that, that was ESSER 1 money. And then the governor's portion, uh, just under $500,000. Those funds have been fully expended at this point. Those funds were used for edgenuity, for uh, devices to get us to a one-to-one -one, uh, environment where we were lacking, as well as uh, uh, internet uh, connectivity and hotspots. ESSER 2 came out, uh, second package towards the end of December and the allocations in January. Uh, we've used just a little bit of, of these funds, not much at all. Uh, ESSER 3 has, uh, has now come out. The allocations came out last Friday. ESSER 2 dollars can be used through September 30th, 2023. ESSER $3 can be used through September 30th, 2024. The total of these three packages is just over $5.1 million, specifically for the Silver Falls School District. $292,000 of the 5.1 will be passed through to the charter schools. As of this date, so this budget, the 21-22 budget, calls for the use of $2.2 million of ESSER funds. About $1.5 million of that is specifically to fill in the gap and to keep our operations up as we're going through all of this uncertainty. Another five, six, uh, another couple hundred, uh, a little over 100,000 will be charter school pass through and then another 500,000 would be specifically for some additional technology needs for more ventilation improve, improvements and other COVID related uh, matters that wouldn't normally be in our operational budget. Let's see here. I think that covers ESSER. Again, there's quite a bit in the back of the uh, budget document that can help guide you uh, through this. The last part has to do with our assumptions related to employee costs. For licensed staff, uh, the 21-22 year will mark year number three of our uh, three-year collective bargaining agreement. And there is a, uh, an agreement for STEP plus 4% cost of living adjustment plus $25 more per month for employer uh, insurance contributions. For classified staff, we have a two-year agreement. The second year starts next year for language, but we only had a one-year agreement for finances for, for this year. So we are in the next couple of weeks starting our financial bargaining and also a reopener for two language items with the classified staff. So uh, I've budgeted STEP plus 2% COLA plus $25 per month for insurance. And I've done the same for admin, confidential, and non-represented staff. That is a consult and confer process with, uh, with the board that has not been finalized either. The one piece of uh, very good news outside of the ESSER dollars uh, well, there's other good news, summer, summer dollars, increasing SIA dollars, et cetera, but PERS rates are actually going back down uh, for this next biennium. So starting July 1st, 2021, the rates will go for tier one and tier two employees. Right now we're being charged with 21.21% of wages. Uh, next year it will be 16, the next two years will be 16.66% of wages. And for OPSERP employees, it goes from 15.76% down to 13.55%. That'll save us approximately $700,000 per year in the general fund, which will actually kind of get us back to the same levels we were in the 17-19 biennium in terms of our uh, PERS costs. So, so that's one bit of good news that does help this, uh, this budget. In addition to that, 
uh, Monday night, the school board will be uh, looking at uh, approving a resolution related to the potential of going out for a pension obligation bond here in August or so. Uh, it doesn't commit us to the action. Uh, the firm committal date is early July, but uh, with uh, 10, 20, and 30 year treasury rates being historically low, there is an opportunity for the district to pay off its unfunded actuarial liability early like it did in 2003 and 2004 and pay uh, PERS with, with uh, the sale of, of the bonds, pay that money to PERS now and get an immediate rate credit of close to 10% off of the rates that I just showed you. Uh, we still don't know if it's going to work, work out because the rates have been going up a little bit. And also there's some talk about uh, PERS assume, assumed earning rates coming down but it's still worth looking at. And there's a resolution on the board agenda that's posted online now uh, that you can take a closer look at, as well as a presentation done by Lauren McMillan at Piper Sandler on March 22nd to the board at the school board work session that, that explains how a pension obligation bond works and specifically for how Silver Falls numbers would break down. Uh, if this does work out and we move forward, we would get a rate credit as early as uh, the end of August, and we could save up to an additional $600,000 next year. That savings is not built into this budget because we don't know if this will be executed or not. But I did budget in Fund 320, that's the PERS bond UAL on our existing PERS bond debt. I did uh, budget for additional debt service uh, to handle the debt service payments if we were to do that. That's a lot of information and there's there's a lot that goes into um, understanding a pension obligation bond, but again, um, that information can be found on next Monday's agenda if you want to look further into that. The last thing I wanted to uh, point out, and I'm close to turning it over to Leslie here, uh, is the special revenue funds that I mentioned at the top of the uh, of the presentation. Uh, the federal stimulus funds we've talked quite a bit about, those uh, funds are built within the general fund. Then uh, just here about six, seven weeks ago, the governor announced uh, special funding specifically for summer school for Oregon school districts, uh, special statewide funding to help address learning loss and get kids back uh, enrolling and getting ready for next year. We have an allotment for Silver Falls of just over $1 million. We do have to match that at 25%. And that could come from a number of different sources, including Measure 98 and SIA dollars, the match. We also have, again, I think our going into our fifth year of high school success dollars or Measure 98. Some of that actually can be used for eighth grade as well, which, which it has been. Leslie will talk about that as well. That is specifically budgeted for in Fund 252. And last, we have the student investment account, which very exciting. Uh, as you recall, our initial allocation for, for this year, which is the first year of the program, was $3 million. Then when COVID hit and the economy dropped uh, like a rock, uh, we were told we were going to get nothing. We ended up getting a million dollars this year, and that was exciting as we were able to launch Sequoia Falls Academy. Next year, our projected allocation, subject to state budget approval, is just over $2.5 million. That is in Fund 251. So you can see that uh, when Scott used the word unique, uh, there is a lot of unique circumstances going on. And you can see here that we have close to $10 million of new or newer resources that we haven't, haven't had, uh, Measure 98 being the, the veteran of, of this group here. Um, and of course, all of this won't be used this year, but I wanted to, to really outline the details of this and how it uh, integrates into our budget over the next few years. 
So now I just want to take a quick, uh, a, a quick, quick walk through the proposed budget. It'll just be a few minutes, but so you understand the sections and how some of this information um, um, flows. I'm going to go ahead and switch to that really quick. Before I do that, uh, does anyone have uh, any any questions at this point? Okay, I'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, this is a 98 page document and I know five or six of you came to the, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I think Jacob did first though. So. Oh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I cannot see all the faces because uh, I'm sharing the screen, my apologies. No, that's, that's okay, thank you, Jonathan. Hey, um, Steve, I seem to remember that two years ago when we were doing these meetings at the beginning of a biennium, uh, we took a different approach with the uh, anticipation of the school allocation fund um, that we, 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 we did our budget based on what we anticipated being the, the higher amount or the, the maximum amount. And, um, and, and it seems like this time we're doing it based on what we anticipate being the minimum amount. So um, when we did this two years ago, the, the rationale was that, um, you know, we're going to appropriate the maximum amount. And if we spend less, then we spend less. And, you know, that was how it was. So could you talk a little bit about the, what the benefit is of doing the appropriation at the anticipated minimum? That's a great question, and thank you for, for bringing that up. I, I think we have gone different directions with that based on, you know, what, what, we, what we heard at the time, you know, if we felt confident enough to go with, with, with a number. Um, there certainly, I think, is benefit to doing that because it does allow you to uh, budget resources and appropriations at a higher level, and then you only spend what you actually get. But um, I think the difference for me on this is I, I really wrestled for a long time about where to go with the enrollment piece, and um, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of questions uh, to be answered on that. Um, we've never experienced that part of it before. Um, you know, we've been fortunate to know that our enrollment's been pretty stable or growing by about a half a percent or what have you. And so I always, in budgeting, we, we would always say, well, even if it went down slightly, we know we have last year's number. And fortunately that saved us this year, but I really do feel like we're not gonna get, you know, 100% recovery, 75% may even be slightly aggressive. So I felt like at this point, Maybe enrollments a, a, a little aggressive, but at least we're going with the nine point one billion dollar number. Even though I do feel like there's a decent chance that that number could go up, and we also have the opportunity in this in this situation, we're already relying on an unsustainable resource. In this case, a federal do dollars this year, while we're trying to figure things out as a shock absorber. If the state school fund number goes up and we get another six hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars, that would mean. Uh, less of the ESSER funds that we would have to use. And we could change that, you know, at the next, as soon as we find out, we could incorporate more state school fund revenue, for example. Sure. And can I ask a quick, quick follow up there? Sure. So let's say we're budgeting at the 9.1 and the final budget that comes out of the legislature is 9.3, 9.4. Is that just a, uh, uh, a board action that then appropriates and allocates that additional funding? Well, we certainly wouldn't uh, most likely not be in, uh, appropriating any additional expenses, which is where the appropriation term is used on the expense side. We would simply say, if it came before the budget committee approved the budget, the budget committee could say, uh, one action we would like to take in, in amending the proposed budget to, uh, to the approved stage would be we're going to spend, let's say, some, let's plug in $700,000 less of federal resources and plug in $700,000 more of state resources to pay for the expenses we already have built in the budget in that scenario. And we would reflect that because anytime we find out some new information, uh, certainly uh, we will incorporate that into the budget as the committee agrees upon it. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you. Sure. And Steve, Jonathan had his hand up. 
Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Steve. So one of the questions that I've got, it I, it kind of goes around this enrollment piece. And, you know, I was doing some quick math and, and I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you know, a hundred kids is, you know, a million dollars. Am I, am I wrong or am I pretty close? Pretty, uh, pretty close. The per, per ADMW figure next year is, is just over $9,000. So yeah, $900,000 plus. Right. So, so with that kind of money on the line, what is our backup plan? I, I agree with you in the past, we haven't had to worry about enrollment. It was always going to be, you know, maybe just better than last year, but certainly flat ish. But if we come in and we're somehow, you, you know, we don't recover to 75%, we only recover to 35% of what we lost. Well, you're looking at a million five. I mean, we're, what's our backup plan? Do we have one that's sort of outlined so that we know exactly what's going to happen in that case? Well, S S Scott mentioned it in his, uh, in, his, in his budget message, and I didn't talk a lot about it, um, much about it actually, was uh, the budget is pretty much a roll, a roll up in terms of the service level from, from this year in terms of budget. We are running slightly less than that budget right now, as we have had, uh, you know, been able to save through attrition this year. So we haven't, you know, cut anyone, but we had some people that left, ret retired, or stepped away for whatever reason. And we'll, we'll probably have some things that happen in the next few months that it invariably happens every year, pandemic or not. And so that allows us to take a close look at, you know, each passing day, more information is found out. So, for example, we're, we're doing enrollment processes at Mark Twain and Robert Frost right now. We don't know, you know, we have the new K-5 configurations. We don't know how many kids are going to come back. We have another three or four schools out there that had pretty significant enrollment drops, but other schools did not. So we have to be able to look at it, you know, situationally and say, you know, we may have a couple, a few schools out there that have, uh, you know, a, a teacher too many based on their enrollment loss, but we don't know yet if it's prudent to, to take that position away, for example. But where we've maybe had some uh, folks leave either on the classified or certified side, a lot of those uh, positions we haven't rehired this year because we were in the online environment. And so we're still, we've, we've done that for 13 or 14 months now, and that has helped us save some money and also position us a little bit to where we could try to you know, protect um, you know, the folks that we do have and take some more time to figure this out. But uh, essentially there might be some repurposing of staff, at least for this year, say if, if one or two schools don't get a strong return, um, you know, there's going to have to be some strategies employed for learning loss and that type of thing. But clearly if the numbers don't come back strong, um, there'll, there'll probably have to be some reduction of FTE, a more purposeful reduction of FTE as we go into the 22-23 year, I would imagine. So, so to summarize, what you're saying is for this coming year, the plan is we'll spend down reserve, but we'll keep, you know, staffing. I mean, I heard the message, but I just wanted to make sure that was true, even if we don't meet the assumptions that were laid out. Yeah, well, there is a, you know, a use of about $600,000 of reserve, but also a very heavy... Uh, reliance on the ESSER dollars, which, you know, that's, you know, we're only looking at a you know, couple, couple of years of having those types of dollars available. So at some point, yes, it's just, again, with not knowing exactly what service model we're going to be in or exactly how many kids are going to walk back in the door, it's hard to make some of those decisions right now. And, and I honestly, too, the other factor at play here, uh, I really believe that, uh, even if they don't increase the $9.1 billion number, I believe that the per student amount can still go up. And the reason for that is, is because I think they've, uh, on the summary sheet for the estimate that ODE put out, I believe they only had a reduction of about 5,000 students statewide, ADMW. ADMW is usually around 708,000 or something like that. I think they still had 703,000. As I went through all the other school districts, state school fund sheets, I saw every district down five to 15%, you know, just, just like we were. And I think that that total number of students statewide funded with, you know, for K-12 will probably be lower than they have on there, which will increase the amount per student, you know, within the pool. So it, it would give, give us more per student. So why we could have 
maybe less than a 75% return, it's possible that that per student dollar amount goes up by 50 or $100, even without uh, an increase in the 9.1. Good point. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and Steve, I, there was um, Jacob. Oh, Jacob had a question within the chat. Um, oh. and, and I think Jacob, you could ask it now if you want to or wait till. Well, I, I see that Director Nealon and Alan Ack have had their hands up. So I'll, I'll let them go and then I'll, I'll come back around. Okay. I'm just trying to keep up. Yeah. So um, let's go with Shelly then on the hand up. I wasn't watching who went up first. Janet had her hand raised first. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So Janet, please. That's all right. Janet, why don't you go ahead and go? That's fine. Mine's, mine's quick. Um, Steve, I don't know if you mentioned this or not. What percent reserve are we still trying to maintain kind of as a matter of yep. you know, sort of prudent, prudent, excuse me, fiscal management here? I, I don't are we still at the four or five percent level? Is it is that going to really drop? Mm -hmm. Where are we with that? Yeah, um, you, you, that's a good question. Usually, when uh, the budget, we we try to hit at least the the, the three percent, and then the actual is usually you know higher higher than that. But I believe that the board uh, policy actually calls for eight percent. So, uh, but in my opinion, eight percent is always a good uh, target. Um, Obviously, we we slipped below that quite a bit, um, our ending fund balance this year, and I think that as we look at that 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 part, I think that'll be a good policy to look at moving forward. I think it it'll be good to craft something that's a little more specific and also looks at it from a biennial approach. So, so is it is significantly lower? Um, let's see. So I have well at at three nine at the end of this year. Um, round numbers here on a forty-six million dollar general fund budget, we would be at eight and a half percent as we oh. have at the end of this year. I think at three point three or three point four, we're going to be slightly below that as it is built into this uh, budget. Okay, well that's still that's still good. That's that's better than I was. Yeah, we were outpacing our goals quite a bit there for three or four years. We were, you know, at twelve to four, eleven to fourteen percent there for three or four years, and. Um, then, then we had some some of these other things uh, happen, and so I imagine can, if we it, did it, it get can change, it can change fast. I know that you know some people thought you know hey five five point five million dollars is is too much, but really that's like two months payroll. That's the yeah. way that I like to uh, to relate it to. And so I imagine if if the legislator were to approve another two to three hundred million dollars, and we would see. You know, I guess with that calculation, somewhere around six hundred thousand dollars a year, right? You mm -hmm. you already have a sense for then what that would backfill. In other words, what what would we would we put the money back in reserves? Would we reduce our ESSER expenditures? Like, sort of, where would that extra, so mm -hmm. to speak, then go um, yeah. so, if that yeah. were to happen? Right. Yeah, I I believe that we would we would probably ratchet back the ESSER expenditures if let's say if we got 200 million dollars more or six it would be about six hundred and thirty five thousand dollars more next year and the year after in that case uh, i would say ratcheting back esser by two or three hundred thousand and then ratcheting okay. back using reserves by two or three hundred thousand okay would be the way to go um, yeah. that's good that's helpful to know thank you uh -huh. shelly well, that was one of my questions, actually. So I knew, yeah, thank you for asking that, Janet. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I actually checked off quite a few of the um, my questions that uh, I was going to ask before you spoke. So that's a good thing. The one thing I did want to know is what, um, I know that you every month, almost every month, you give us a financial report. What is, and, and school enrollment, this, you know, what is our, what is the difference in the enrollment the last time you talked to us and mm. now? And what what does that look like? Sure. Is it changing rapidly for the fall? Are people coming, you know? Yeah. It's almost a day-to-day -day change, I suppose, but it's sure. nice to get updates on yeah. that. Yes. So there's um, a fresh enrollment report. Um, it's actually on the uh, board agenda for Monday. 
and then also pages S2 and S3 Okay. on this budget document here, which I can jump to on this screen. I'm sorry, I'm still sharing my screen. How rude of me here. <laughs> oh, that's uh, okay. Make it a little better there. That's there the least of our worries. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in the back of the budget document, pages S2 and S3, uh, there's a monthly report and then yeah. Even though you saw the historical report earlier this year, I thought yep. for the budget committee it would be useful to 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 bring that back forward just to see. Yeah. But anyway, you can see uh, we hit the low point mm -hmm. end of January at three thousand five hundred and forty students, mm -hmm. which includes the charter schools, by the way. Mm -hmm. And the last three months we have uh, inched up, and it it inch is a key word here because yeah. we're back up to about well, it's 35.79 but at least the trend is in the right direction um, yeah we had five six months in a row there where it was uh, going down so we're still down 361 students for nine point nine nine point two percent district wide and that's the most current numbers you have that was through april 30th yes through april 30th okay i don't know if something else came out then I meant okay. to look today just to kind of see what's happened over the last week, but uh, right. I, I, forgot. Um, I was hoping we could at least get to 3,600. <laughs> well, we and for reference, folks, we were at uh, 3,940 on June 1st. Mm -hmm. Including okay. the charter schools, which the charter schools usually have about 250 or 60 of their own yeah. total kids. So just a real uh, brief um, walk through here on this uh, document. Um, go back to the share screen here. So basically there's uh, the assumption, uh, there's a description of funds, which I think is quite helpful. And then the assumptions, which I, whoops, sorry, I didn't reshare the screen here. The fund descriptions, the assumptions page, and then the, the resource and requirements summary by by fund, which is a very just high level deal. And then once you get to uh, essentially page one, you're going to get through. You're going to have a, a page or two for every fund uh, for resources or revenue. And then once you get to page. Uh, 22 you have the re, uh, expenditures or requirements report uh, for the general fund specifically and this is arranged by function and major object and again remember uh, you'll see this in the program budget and accounting manual manual any function that begins with the number one is a direct instructional service uh, and this is is ordered uh, numerically by function. Once you get down to functions that begin with the number two, that is a support service like transportation, counseling, human resources, superintendent, office of the principal, those types of services, speech, nursing. Uh, so it'll go right on through for you. And the way that this is formatted, the columns are very important. You get two years of prior actuals. So in this case, actuals 2018 and 19 and 2019, 20, last year's adopted budget, and then this year's proposed budget. So it allows you to compare uh, quite a bit of data to see the progression of data. It also includes the FTE. So the requirements report for the general fund specifically goes uh, on your not on this not the screen page number but the page number here at the bottom on the on the page itself is from pages 22 to 59 and then uh, you get into the uh, requirement reports for the other funds uh, funds and 200 funds which are special revenue funds specifically dedicated for for, for specific uh, uses title grants, IDEA, uh, the SIA funds, the Measure 98, those, those types of funds, those types of resources. 
any any fund that begins with the number three is a debt debt service fund, general obligation bond, a pension obligation bond, our Schlater uh, loan that we have. Um, those are in fund 300. We have capital projects in fund 400. Internal service funds are fund 600. And then the, the 700 funds are specifically the two charter school budgets, which we don't uh, oversee or guide in any way here. Uh, their, their own boards uh, adopt their budgets, but we, we do their uh, accounting and uh, help with their accounts payable and payroll. And so we attract those in fund 700, which are trust and agency funds. So then last you get to, uh, uh, once you get to page 82, uh, that ends the detailed part of the budget and you get into the supplementary section and you'll see that uh, this page here specifically, I had a few of these that were pulled out onto my PowerPoint uh, presentation, but there's the, the enrollment pages here that I just discussed, uh, the state school fund grant uh, estimates for 21, 22 and 22, 23. Uh, here is a page that gives you some good detail on the CARES Act. I will say that it does have one mistake on it uh, it says that SR2 is available through September 30th, 2024. It's actually September 30th, 2023, but I think this flow chart was really, really helpful. And then this is a side-by-side -side, uh, situation of the different uses for uh, SR, SR, SR2 and, and SR3 uh, that I think is helpful. This is also on the ODE. Uh, website. So with that, uh, I am, I'm actually going to go ahead and... Um, hey, Steve, yeah. uh, to interrupt real quick, there, there are three hands up currently, so okay. um, yeah. this is All a good time right. for you to pause. Absolutely. Take... I just stopped sharing the screen. I'm done uh, with that. I, I'm sorry I couldn't see everyone's faces, but I can now. So yes, please go right ahead. And I won't, I'm just going to call them in order on my screen, but Astrid, uh, is up uh, with her hand and um, we'll go from there and down. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. I've got two questions actually. The first is um, the the bottom line on page 82 of the, the breakdown um, doesn't seem to match. Uh, I would have expected it to match with the bottom line on uh, Roman numeral eight. And so I'm just wondering if if I'm not understanding something or if uh, there's something else going on there. Okay. Yeah, so that's a, a real good question, Astrid. So there's actually two different reports uh, that were, were run. So pages 22 through 59 are specifically Fund 100 or the general fund. Mm -hmm. Pages 60 through 82 is a requirement report, requirements report that um, it, it it's a little bit different. It doesn't show quite as much in the object detail. Um, and so that total is for funds 200 through the 700 funds. So you would have to add up the total on page 82 and the total on page 59 uh, for the whole requirements for all the funds. Okay, thank you. That makes more sense. That's a great, and great question. The Please other one... My other question, if I may, is a little bit more, um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, so I, you've been talking about some staffing attrition and obviously there's also discussion about um, student attrition. Um, so I'm just curious what approximately, like approximately how many staff do we have per say 100 students um, in a normal year? Uh, and is that level, are, are the two levels going to be commensurate as we go through the staff attrition and the student attrition? You mean, is it going to keep that same type of a ratio? Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking specifically licensed or any uh, type of employee? I mean, they, they all contribute to the, to the budget. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's specifically some student teacher ratios for classroom instructors, of course. Um, and as far as answering questions on uh, like a total number of staff per 100, I'd have to, I think that would be a, my first uh, 
question for me to to get back to the group on before before and and at the next meeting. I will be taking you know any questions I can't answer now. I'll make sure that I follow up on and then as you go into the weekend and next week, please email me any detailed questions you have. I will assemble a list of Q and A, and before our next meeting, we'll email it out to the group and we'll get it posted on Boardbook for everyone to see. But that is a question I, I just don't think I can answer at this point. But in terms of student teacher type ratios, you know, typically we're in the, you know, uh, there's there's class size targets for every grade, like K five and six, eight, and nine, 12. And, you know, usually we're in the, I guess, 20 to 26 range on, on average. And certainly you'll see there's school profile uh, sheets that are also posted under item number five. You'll see that uh, it has last year's enrollment as well as this year, well, this year's enrollment and um, uh, projected for next year. And you'll see that there are um, four or five schools that, you know, where they had a more severe student enrollment drop where um, they have the same number of teachers and you might see a school that has an average of say 17 or 18, which is not something that we could sustain, but we don't know what the return rate is going to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, and actually I was going to follow up on that really quick because in the past we have had those target district mm -hmm. kind of grade level yeah. enrollments for grades across right. the district. And um, that's why I was looking through the past couple of budgets. Um, we didn't have it last year in the budget, at least that I had printed. But the year before that, uh, two years ago, we had a, a target okay. on enrollment. And so yeah. that... Um, it's kind of a guidance a sure. recommendation by the district. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get that document and make sure that it gets uh, shared out uh, for the next meeting and something we can talk about further as well. So uh, just going down the list again, uh, Matt had uh, the next step on the hand. Uh, so Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Peter. So really, I'm looking at the numbers on uh, pages 22 to, to 25 related to textbooks, computer software, and computer hardware. Uh, we've reduced investments on textbooks from 70,000 down to 20,000. Um, and computer software hasn't really taken an uptick other than the 10,000 this year. So looking at this from more of an education perspective, and I, I apologize if I'm missing something here, but um, mm -hmm. how are the decisions being made as it relates to a decrease in funding for textbooks but a slight increase in software because the software would have to naturally augment yeah. what's missing from textbooks. I do see a hardware increase, which is great. Um, that probably leads to, you know, the iPads and the laptops getting out there, but mm -hmm. it's really curious on decision-making mm -hmm. for downward trend and recovery for textbooks, and then a really low blip on software. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, Matt. And I'm actually, uh, we'll have Leslie address that in her presentation, but I, I can tell you that textbooks specifically, there's adoption cycles with the Department of Education and there's different subjects that are adopted uh, that, that can have quite a bit of cost variance. For example, an English textbook adoption would cost quite a bit more than um, um, you know, English and math maybe being you know, the big ones versus uh, maybe a, a, a second language adoption or something like that. Uh, and there's there's rotations. And I know most districts have actually been behind on some of the adoptions. I know that there's plans for um, more textbook adoption. And then there's the technology piece, like you said. But uh, I believe there's plans for more textbook adoptions that would actually come out of our uh, student investment account, uh, which is fund uh, to this is the, the, the page that you you talked about was specifically in the general fund and um, I think there's going to be some more textbook adoption within the student investment account which is fund 251 but I'll have Leslie address that even further during her remarks okay thank you mm -hmm. and then Robin had um, your hand in um, yeah, a um, couple of my questions on the numbers were just answered, so that's great. Um, the only one I have left then is just a quick clarification for me. 
on back to the enrollment, not to take us completely back there, but just on the different schools, something was mentioned casually and maybe I misunderstood it, but because we're site-based budgeting and the way that the numbers worked out, a school like Central Health, for example, went down 64 students. If that school in particular or a school doesn't come back up with their numbers, did you mention that there is a plan for that to help that out with that particular school to bring that equitable and bring it up um, other than eliminating a teacher position? Well, I know, um, for example, at Central Hall, they are one of the ones that, that had quite a severe enrollment. They're also one of the schools that, that gets uh, a lot of their enrollment from the Salem-Kaiser side of the line. Uh, and in speaking with Dustin, uh, he, feels, he feels quite confident that uh, if we were back to five-day in-person instruction, that his school is going to come close to filling right back up. Um, if they were to stay down at that number, then, you know, that's... Uh, you know, that might be a situation where you know maybe there's a, a, a remediation room set up with one of the existing teachers um you know leslie could probably speak to that more expertly than i could in terms of strategies uh, that we could use for next year as we see what happens um, but it's also possible that you know maybe there's another school that doesn't have quite as much enrollment drop that lost a teacher and maybe maybe there would be a situation where a school like central how would need to have one less teacher and a teacher would move to a different building, for example. I mean, that's jumping way ahead of the game, but there's going to be a lot of different situations. Every situation is going to have to be looked at in, in due course. Um, and the more time that passes, the more information we get and the more we try to figure out. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I know it's been a hot topic of discussion. So I was just always curious how that sort of reflects in the budget. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and just to follow up on that, Rob, and, and that was a question that I was going to ask is how uh, are these fluctuations and projections in enrollment going to be absorbed or adjusted uh, with, with kind of the site-based approach that's gone on in the past and, and you know, looking into this next budget cycle. So um, maybe that's something we can continue on um, a topic later and, and we'll learn some more when, when um, Leslie Roach uh, presents too, but um, that, that was a question I had as well with that enrollment kind of drop at some sites. Yeah. So Steve, do you have, do you want to continue or do you? Uh, you no, I, at this point that was, uh, that was all I had. And uh, thank you for sticking with me and I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. I know she has a PowerPoint that she's going to share on her screen. So thank you, Leslie, for uh, adding some additional insights to these programs. Thank you. And so, yeah, uh, with that coming up is, is Leslie Roach, the Director of Teaching and Learning. And thank you, Steve, uh, and for taking the questions and, and appreciate everyone asking the questions. I think these are good. And I'm glad it's opening up some discussion and, and we're uh, moving forward. But uh, it's just uh, been a great process so far. So, um, Leslie, um, take it away. Thanks, everyone. Um... I have the privilege tonight to speak with you about our budget and how it relates to our strategic plan. And tonight I'm going to focus on the 20,000 foot view of how we're using our funds to meet our goals um, and the variety of funds that we now receive um, to meet our goals. So I'm going to walk us through at a very high level. I'm happy to take questions um, at the end, or uh, like Steve shared, you can always email me questions that I can follow up on with all of you. So our strategic plan, you've heard it a couple of times. Goal number one and two fit smack dab into teaching and learning. So goal number one is each student is on track to graduate every year. And goal number two is each student has the social and emotional learning skills to navigate their world. So school funding is becoming more complicated. Um, we have multiple funding sources and each of these funding sources actually has their own particular guidelines and requirements that we are responsible for following and reporting on. Um, I'm going to be sharing some information this evening about several of those funding sources and how they are helping um, our school district meet our goals. So you can see some of these funding sources listed here. 
Um, our first two goals in our strategic plan are actually pretty interconnected. Um, we, uh, our community really values a well-rounded education, and you'll see that these funding sources actually um, support both of these goals in many cases. Um, the first thing I want to talk about this evening is um, something that you've probably heard uh, Scott talk about a few times this year is we've launched a multi-year plan to create a guaranteed and viable curriculum in our school district. Um, this year, uh, a quick recap, if you haven't heard this about this before, um, our goal is that no matter what school or teacher every child has in the Silver Falls School District, that we are guaranteeing that that child is receiving the same high quality education throughout the course of their experience here. Um, this year, we have worked with teacher teams to create district level maps of learning standards, kindergarten all the way through high school. And we're gonna continue this work over the course of the next few years. Uh, teacher teams will be using these um, district-wide maps next year in an ongoing process to plan unit maps. Um, and once they're through unit maps, they'll look at those learning standards and um, plan common assessments. And once they start giving those common assessments, they'll start looking at their student data and talking about how they're going to adjust their instruction based on how students are learning. So uh, that's the, the plan that we have moving forward for what we'll be working towards. And of course, that takes a lot of teacher time and we're working with some wonderful um, uh, consultants and coaches to support us in this work. So we are directly working towards achieving our first goal with this work, uh, that all students are on track to graduate every year. Uh, another big project we've been working on this year is reconfiguring Mark Twain and Robert Frost to be two equal K-5 elementary schools. Uh, this supports our two uh, goals by lessening transitions, both for academic and social emotional learning. Um, and that uh, relates to the budget because we are aligning staffing models to offer similar experiences and supports at both buildings. And we will also dip a little bit into goal number three with this one. Um, we are making some ADA upgrades to the restrooms in both of these buildings. The preschool promise grant. So uh, we received a grant for preschool promise from the Oregon Department of Education this year. And despite the pandemic, we were able to start our very first preschool um, in mid-year this year. And we are in the process of reapplying for the grant again next year. Uh, we are hoping to use a site on the high school campus for preschool next year. Currently, we're in a local church. Um, our capacity for preschool will be a, approximately 20 students. So we're just taking a baby step in this direction, but we are very excited at the idea of preschool and pre-K and how it will help us reach our two goals. Um, getting kids ready to enter school at the kindergarten level is a very important step. Uh, summer learning opportunities. This one is, is new and we're learning more every day. Um, House Bill 5024A um, was released this year with the goal to support students more due to the pandemic. Um, this is guaranteed grant funding for us from the state and there are multiple components to the grant. We will be offering two of the components, which is high school credit recovery and K-8 enrichment opportunities. Uh, we have multiple school sites who are in the midst of planning right now. Um, and we're really looking at uh, camp type opportunities. So STEAM camp, um, sports camps, really themes that are fun, that uh, kids want to attend, to bring kids back into our schools in person, following all of our uh, safety guidelines so that they are um, building relationships with their peers, they're building relationships with staff, and really skill building as well as for academics and for social emotional, and really focusing uh, for our high school students on 
getting those credits that they missed because of COVID um, up to date so that they are ready to hit the ground running in the fall. Um, so again, we, we really think that the summer learning opportunities will support our two goals as well. And we're very excited at the opportunity. And I checked um, just before we started our meeting and we have about 50 employees who have filled out the form that they're interested in working this summer. So that's just fabulous on top of all of that. <laughs> High school success funds, otherwise known as Measure 98, we're actually beginning year four next year of the four-year original plan that we wrote for uh, Measure 98 High School Success. And this one is very targeted in four areas. Um, we have been tasked with this money to expand career and technical education opportunities, to expand college level opportunities, to focus on dropout prevention, and to support our middle school students to enter high school successfully and aware of all of the CTE and college opportunities that we offer. Um, so this funding is, um, there's lots of requirements with this particular one. We are required to write goals and collect data and to do a lot of reporting for this particular fund. And our um, assistant principal, James Rise, actually did a wonderful job presenting this opportunity and all of our data uh, this year. It was He was new to um, this responsibility and he did a fabulous job and it's a peer review group that he actually had to present to so he's that's sometimes very difficult presenting to your peers and um, making sure all your data is correct so kudos to James and the high school for all of their work um, tracking all of this. I know many of you have tuned in and heard about our student investment account a couple of times this school year. Um, we, with our partially funded account this year, we prioritized funding for Sequoia Falls and we supported our most at-risk high school students. We will continue to use our student investment account to fund Sequoia Falls next year. Uh, we will also be supporting the increase of social worker and school counselor positions. Um, we will continue to expand our bilingual support center. We uh, got that started this year and we'll continue to add to it and um, include more translation and interpretation services. We believe it's so important that all of our families and students receive communication in their home language. Um, and we have, we have work to grow in that area. Um, our SIA funds will also be used to purchase a, a culturally responsive and disability supportive literacy instructional material. So that maybe gets to that textbook question. Um, we are going to be um, purchasing materials that are more up to date and um, we are using our student investment account to uh, fund that purchase. We're, it last year when we were starting to look into this before the budget was cut for the student investment account, we were looking at close to $500,000 for that purchase. So you can see why we'd wanna use the student investment account for that. Um, we um, are also looking at funding professional development in the culturally responsive and disability supportive um, areas as well to support those new instructional materials and instructional practices for our staff. Uh, we also have a variety of federal title funds that we will continue to use um, in several ways. We are um, really aligning our systems district-wide to track student behavior data in order to respond to student needs appropriately. Um, and this includes professional development for our staff members in trauma-informed practices and inclusive practices. Um, this aligns with SIA, but our title funds also um, align really well with that. We will continue to purchase the Youth Truth Survey in order to collect feedback and data from our students, parents, and staff. We think that feedback and data is very important to form our practice, inform our practices um, so that we're 
really have the data to reflect back to the community and the progress we're making towards our goals. Um, so as you can see, we have many different approaches to meeting our goals, and we have a variety of funding sources to get there as well. Um, I believe that our district is continuing to learn and grow and create an environment for students to thrive. And I hope that this was um, helpful for you all to see kind of the different ways that we are spending our money. So thank you all. Uh, are there, oh, I see a hand up from Matt and I will scroll down. So Matt, you are first up with a hand raise. Yeah, yeah Leslie, questions. thank you very, thank you, Leslie, for the, for the presentation there. Um, and I'll just go back to, to the comment uh, earlier to Steve, just so I can best understand in terms of um, investments for textbooks and software and, and how we're, we're bridging the gap there as it relates to education. You know, there, there is a downward trend projecting from 2018 into 2022 for textbooks and the uptick on software is, is quite minimal. The hardware is fine. So I'm just I'm just trying to understand when it comes to you know your, the point you made multi year plan to create a guaranteed and viable curriculum. How does that come together in terms of the decisions that are made for the type of software and the the lack of return on on textbooks. So the guaranteed and viable curriculum is really the standards and we're taking those standards and building our instruction around those. And then we will have instructional materials to use in order to deliver those standards. Um, so the textbook budget item that you saw in previous years were for specific adoption. So our high school social studies department um, adopted and purchased some new materials. Our K-8 science um, adoption happened. And that actually, our K-8 science adoption is all digital. We, many of our new adoptions are not a text, in forms of a textbook, they're actually um, a digital subscription. And so they might go into a different funding source so it wouldn't be represented under textbooks. Um, we, so that $70,000, I can't, I can go back and look exactly what we purchased with it, but our next big purchase, our next, next year in the ODE adoption cycle is for English language arts. And so that's the um, instructional material that we'll be focusing on purchasing next year. We've actually spent the last two years listening to publishing um, presentations. And then this year we ran a pilot on a um, instructional material through a publishing company. And the team is getting back together to, to rate that material actually in just two weeks and um, decide our next steps. So we're spending a lot of time examining the different instructional materials. And then next year, we will use our student investment account to purchase those materials. And like I said, when we started pricing out the materials that we piloted this year, we were about $500,000. So it, it will be a significant purchase. Okay, thanks for the additional color on that. You're welcome. So I don't see any other hands up, but there was a, a comment posted uh, in the chat, Leslie, and, and this may not be directed specifically to you, but uh, maybe it's a good time to bring it up, just looking um, at the agenda. But kind of the question, um, it's from Astrid, and the question was, uh, I will just read it, um, let's see. Are the sites funded based on their, and I'm assuming ADM admin, or based on their needs. And that was one of the, so are, are the sites funded based on the administration um, and how they choose to allocate the funds? I think this is coming to the, the site based versus kind of a centralized funding. And Astrid is, I think, online now. So if you could chime in, Astrid, I think you can do better than I can. Sorry, but by, by ADM, I meant enrollment. Okay, so it was actually enrollment. So. So that actually ties into the question I was going to follow up with. With uh, I haven't seen kind of the allocations to the different schools. 
Um, it, it's been brought up in the past by myself and I think a few others, but um, when funds are allocated to sites, there's some, uh, at least the matrix, and I'm looking back at the 2019-2020 budget, and I thought it, we had some adjustment. I couldn't find it from last year. But there is a, a funding factor that every school gets, and it's based on a couple of factors, one being a, a small enrollment, and then there's a, a factor that multiplies the allocation if it's a K-8, uh, a middle school or a high school, and it adjusts it by a few percentages from a, a 1.1, 1.2% uh, for a, a K-8 upwards of a 5% for the middle school and 10% for the high school. Um, that funding factor, I asked the question a couple of years ago, um, what was the basis for allocating more funds per student? Uh, and since we're reconfiguring some of the schools, um, the, the K-5 uh, reconfiguration, uh, I haven't seen any reconfiguration of that allocation on a site-based, uh, and it, it, it is based on enrollment. Every student gets a certain point in, in funding to that site. So where is that in the budget and how has that been looked at in this, this budget cycle? Because I didn't see anything. Yeah, um, I believe that sheet was produced last year, but it was not this year. Um, a lot of, well, really for two reasons. One, we're, we're trying to move away from that. And two, because we're in such an odd situation with a 10% uh, enrollment drop and then every school is in a little bit different situation. Um, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, uh, distribute a certain amount of money uh, to each school to, to budget. It, it, it but it's still really the foundation of it is still based on the enrollment of that school and what the the uh, class size targets are or a student to teacher ratio. And I know that that is a, uh, I think it's prescribed in the, in, in the board policy. So it's a policy. So I, it's really all based on, still based on that foundation. That, that little uh, funding factor or additional weight had to do with grades. And I know we've talked about that the last two or three years and uh, I think K2 is a, a 1.0, so in that particular case, Mark Twain, um, but schools that were uh, K8s were like a 1.125 because the, the grades, uh, higher, higher, the higher you get in the, the grade levels, the, the more expensive it is to run uh, or to educate a student through middle school and high school. And so the high school had the, uh, the highest, uh, highest weight. Uh, but we also talked about last year, and that's not uncommon, but essentially, uh, you know, if, if a school had uh, uh, 100, 100 students, for, for example, a, K, a, K, a K-5 school, you know, we'd be looking to get four to five teachers in that school. It doesn't matter what school they are or where they're located. Uh, it's just based on a, on a ratio, and they really, they're really not being handed money to decide, you know, get three teachers or get five teachers because they would have to be held to the standard by which that the district is saying, we wanna keep class sizes below 25 or what have you. They really don't, the principals really don't have the opportunity to make that decision. Teacher, average teacher cost this year is $111,000, all, 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 all cost of payroll and, and salary and benefit. So they pretty much, they just have to say, well, here's my FTE. And then when it's all said and done, they have a little bit of uh, discretionary money left over. That's really the only uh, money that they have to, to, you know, to work with. And basically they're getting X amount that's going to pay for X amount of teachers based on a district ratio uh, for X amount of FTE as a, a principal. And we have schools that have anywhere from a 0.2 principalship to one principal or more. Uh, and then uh, basic support services like custodial, uh, educational assistance, media, counseling, all the schools get you know, some sort of ratio of those resources as well. Uh, and it's not really money per se, they're, they're resources that are getting into their school. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, that, that went beyond the sheets, uh, that, that particular summary sheet, uh, schools, uh, certain schools have higher special ed populations or ELL populations, for example, and there could be additional uh, 
employee resources pushed into those schools from the ELL budget or the special education budget based on the, uh, the demographic makeup of those schools. And that's why the school profile sheets are very helpful. Um, there's two sheets for every school and that's uh, linked under the proposed budget on number five of, of board book. Uh, there's one that has graphs that, that show the demographic makeup of that school. And then there's the second profile sheet that shows uh, the staffing uh, from teachers to classified to admin. And then at the very bottom of, it, of, e of each sheet in gray color are the additional district resources pushed into those schools based on the needs, which really addresses equity uh, for those specific schools. So really things are being done in, in very much a, a like manner. It's just, uh, I think, um, being shown in a different way. And, you know, basically for principals, what we asked them to do this year was give us two scenarios for enrollment, kind of a, a worst case and maybe a more hopeful case. And then we also just, I just told them, you know, basically you're going to get about the same amount of discretionary money um, next year as you have this year. And we actually made it even more simple for them. Uh, they used to have to budget their substitute teacher and classified substitute costs within their discretionary funds, which was really never fair to them because, you know, if they, some, some schools have more, you know, absences in a specific year. We actually had a 10 day rule where the district would pick up if someone was gone for more than 10 days, but we basically took all of the district uh, substitute budget and put it in the teaching and learning budget. And they don't have to deal with that at the school level anymore. So that, decreased their discretionary a little bit, and we just took that out of the equation. We're also centralizing technology uh, at, in the technology budget instead of at the school level. So the discretionary uh, amounts are, um, you know, they're about the same as they were last year, but we've taken those two things out of it. And then the rest of it's just based on staff and ratios that are, you know, really quite equivalent uh, among schools. So I know that's a long answer, but that's, that's kind of the progression. And, and, I, and I guess the, the, the short follow up is it, it would be nice to see again the metric at which the funds are being distributed on a single page because as I stare at this, uh, the questions come up before is that when I look at the funding factor, which is the multiplication allocation per student, uh, you have Robert Frost and Mark Twain as a one. So they have no multipl multiplication. They have no um, small school size um, enhancement or, mm -hmm. or increase either. And, and those two schools on the profile sheets are demonstrated as the highest um, free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, diversity wise in their makeup of student population. When it comes to special services, my understanding is that is a subset and that's why I was trying to look at the individual site sheets and do some division but to make this the short answer I think it'd be great to have this sheet repeated because there were some adjustments um, I thought last year there was an adjustment in the funding factor at the high school level um, which has a 10 percent increase but on top of that the district or the goal for enrollment also varies. So as the higher the grade level, mm -hmm. the higher the enrollment. And therefore you're getting an inflation again, not necessarily an inflation, but you're getting an increase in budget. So if I have an estimated enrollment of 28 kids, that's my target at the high school versus let's say 24 at the middle school. I'm just throwing these numbers out, 24 at the middle school. And ideally let's go 22 elementary um, mm -hmm. at the third grade level that right there is an incremental decrease in funding because the district's goal is to have a capacity. So you have a higher capacity and it's given an allocation of per student. And on top of that, you're giving a funding factor increase. So it's a doubling of the increase. So I only have more people in my class as a high school teacher. I understand the resource allocation, but then looking at these schools, in the past configuration, um, the two schools that show the highest of free and reduced lunch and the highest needs, um, that's always been a concern of mine. That's why I'd like to see that. 
um, yeah, before one, making one, any one more thing, comments. One of the things that the, the, re, the, the, the profile sheet will show is, is not just the special education uh, you know, staffing, whether it be uh, licensed or classified, they get pushed in, but they're also uh, designated as, as title schools. We have five or six title schools. And so that means uh, they get a separate allocation that's funded not even in the general fund or on that, that sheet that you referred to from last year and years past, which is why the profile sheet is helpful because they, they might have a title one <clears throat> teacher or an assistant that another school may not have. And, and and again, I don't want to. This uh, title one is in, in enrichment, enhancement, and uh, no, extra that has to do That has to do with it, it's all based on poverty. So if that school has a higher free and reduced, they're a title one school, like like a Robert Frost. Well, and 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 as the as the chair, I will I will defer till if we could get something a little more, we'll move on, because I think I'll follow up with some some uh, follow-up with that myself. So. And just and just so the committee knows, we did not produce that sheet this year, but we can put last year's sheet out there just so people know what we're referring to. Uh, and also, I think looking through those school profile sheets will also be very helpful for everyone as well. I, I think in combination, it would help. I, I just, I've been getting some questions from other folks outside and it would help myself, I think, as well as them, because I can't answer those questions okay. on behalf of the district, um, but they are looking for that information. So that would be helpful. Um, sure. So thanks. Uh, Shelly, you had your hand up for a quick question or comment. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking along the same lines. Um, I feel like in past years, we've had a lot more detail um, about individual schools and their budgets. Um, and um, the principals used to come and um, share their budgets and what they were gonna do with their budgets at their schools. Um, and that really helped clarify some questions specifically um, because of site-based budgeting and what they had planned to do with their budgets. Um, and I feel like over the last few years, it's just kind of gotten, you know, we got away from that and then I feel like there isn't a lot of specific detail with this, the, the specific um, schools, but um, I mean, I was looking at my booklet from like three years ago and, you know, there was each school was, you know, had their own sheets and it, it, it showed how much the administrators made. It showed, you know, how much their textbook costs and how much their software and hardware costs. It was very, the line items were very clear. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that too. Um, and I feel like we've kind of gotten away from that and I don't know what changed to make us not go in that direction anymore. Do you think well, you could help with well, that, honestly, that process? Again, the, the profile sheets do show uh, actual dollar amounts for the last two years, actual last year's budget and this year's budget on the graph looking school profile page. And then the, um, the second profile page includes the detailed FTE by by category. Um, this is actually the third district I've been in over a course of 20 years and, and the previous two districts I've been in, I principals did not present to the budget committee. It takes up a lot of time. Um, even in Corvallis, that didn't happen. And um, I was surprised to see it when I came here. And I really think a lot of it had to do with the, you know, um, so, uh, different districts merging into one and that was something that was was wanted uh, last year was the first year we didn't have all the principals come and present and um, as you know i'm more than happy to talk about any details um, and there's a lot of details included with all the information presented tonight but um, unfortunately I, I believe that that those presentations, you know, there was there was a, a few times where one principal was presenting and, and answered questions for an hour and 15 minutes. And it really, you know, kept the focus of the of, of the process and the meeting, you know, probably a little bit too far down in the weeds for, for too long. Not not that any any question is 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 valid and should be asked, but um, as you can tell here, there's 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 about 10 different new things going on just this year that you know would probably get shortchanged in the conversation if we were 
you know, spending nine hours on school presentations. Um, and really, you know, the, the schools were, were really working under the same umbrella for, you know, a, st a strategic plan. And, and I think it's something that throughout the year we, we try to present, you know, it, to me, everything's relates to the budget, you know, as far as whether it's the SIA plan or, you know, the Mark Twain, Robert Frost reconfiguration, or, you know, it could be anything. And so, um, the committee could definitely ask for a principal uh, to, to, to come or to uh, to do some more focus or drill down on schools, but uh, hopefully the profiles could really tell the story. That was the goal, and that that one profile sheet was just developed here a couple of years ago, and it was intended to provide you know pretty much the same information that was on that budget worksheet, which was really just an internal worksheet for developing the budgets in the past. So so that that was kind of some of the mindset around around the change. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. I do appreciate it. I just, I'm missing the principals come and share their excitement for what they were going to do with their budget. Um, and some principals had certain things one year and then uh, their school, you know, you know, something changed at their school and they were going to implement something new the next year. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I mean, it was, it was more of getting a face-to-face -face look mm -hmm. um, and just really kind of connecting with the budget committee. Sure. Um, I thought it was a proactive, um, uh, you know, gesture. Um, and we, you know, the budget committee only meets like three times before, you know, there's a decision. <laughs> so it's nice to get as much information as possible. If we met seven times, I think it would be different. But, um, you know, it was just, yeah. it was just nice to have. So and I, there's a lot of new budget committee members, and I wanted them to know what sure. had happened previously. And, and such. So anyway, but part, part, part of the thinking behind that as well is that the principals are asked to do a spring uh, a kind of a fall and a spring presentation to the board um, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the year, which is really uh, tells the, the story about their school and really relates to what they're doing, you know, budgetarily as well. And just, you know, because that in, those presentations were being done and also just to respect the time of the principals who have a lot of nighttime commitments, that was part of the conversation as well. So ah, that, that's just okay. kind of, again, just, just to add a little bit, a little bit more to it there. So. Oh, well, that's good to know the thought process behind it. So <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, I guess at this point it is um, obviously we have agenda to continue on. It's nine o'clock. Would um, we like a two minute uh, break to go stand up and stretch, or do you want to keep plowing through? But I think I think uh, uh, we can do it just with a quick visual thumbs up. But I think uh, I would like to, to stand up and take a walk around um, for a couple of minutes. And let's uh, it's nine o two according to my computer. Uh, let's reconvene back, if, if okay, uh, at 9.07. You have five minutes. Is that going to be good? Yes, thank you. If not, I'll stay here and talk to you. But let's uh, turn our cameras off and see you back at 9.07. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we are back at uh, 9.07. We'll give a few seconds to let people come on back in. Uh, well, Steve, thanks for taking those questions. Uh, Leslie, uh, as well. Um, I guess uh, during the break, I don't want to have anyone think of too many more questions, but let's uh, kind of keep moving forward with the agenda because we are at nine. So um, that takes us to, uh, unless there's anything else that someone would like to, to bring up, we are going to move into the public comment. Oh. I have not had any requests so far. So do I still need to read the public comment uh, language or just uh, wait a minute and say if folks are interested? I think I need to pull that document up. Um, but they would email or they are in attendees on the list. Can they, um, are they able to respond if they're interested?
Peter, I think we would need to open the chat for all all participants to have that opportunity. Okay. So, so to who, access who, the chat. Who, who has that authority? <laughs> Maddie, how easy is that for you to do? I can do that, no problem. Okay, so um, Peter, we'll just open that chat up for a minute. If that and, works. I, and I guess as, as we open that chat up, it, um, it was brought to my attention by, by a couple of people and it's always been a, a challenge getting the word out. But if there is some way or any way that we can you know, better, um, I know there are regulations and, and the timing is all uh, allocated and, I, and, and, and the meeting was notified to the public in plenty of time, but there are any avenues or ways the school district can, can reach out to folks prior to an announcement um, a minute or two on, on Zoom. Um, it would be great. Uh, we run into this challenge at the Planning Commission, and, and, and I'm sure City Council has the same challenges, but uh, it, it's a difficult time for folks to step up and, and hang in for a two-hour Zoom meeting until they, they get a chance, but uh, I'm just talking to fill time at the moment. So has anyone... I would agree with you, Peter. I've had people ask me the same thing. So about getting the notice out. It, 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 Thank you. A, it, 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 it is a common theme and I don't think it's anyone's fault by any means um, because the information is out there. So it, it's published, it's put out and you can find it, but um, in our lives that are busy, sometimes a little extra kindness and extension of, of that is, is helpful, but um, it just uh, still filling time. I'm, I I'm see. Looking. Actually, I see from Ray, Kaiser has a question. Yeah. yeah. And um, I don't know if he is on or wanting to speak, but I'll just, I guess I will read it. Uh, I assume that music teachers and computer science teachers, for example, might be roving. How does that not fit into the budget? So um, if, uh, if you know, Ray could come on and, and um, comment on that, I just read it because it was there, but um, we don't have any more public comment. I think we're gonna need to move on. And, I, and there's some discussion going on. So I will let you figure out how to get them to come in. All right. we, have, we have several folks in the chat that, that appear to, to want to have public comment. And I just, um, at this point, don't know how to best facilitate that. So Peter, just that as a clarification, is the purpose for them to make statements or ask questions of the budget I'm just curious. Uh, there, well, I, I guess when they're coming on, uh, that's true. Thank you, Dan. Um, they need to come on and do public comment. I'm just, I'm just talking to fill time at this right. point. So, um, but if so there I are folks Maddie that want could, to come, Maddie could promote them. Correct, Maddie. Yes, that's usually the way it works. Okay. And then, then, then should I just add a, since Dan, we're talking, should I read the uh, the public comments? Yeah, I think so. If, if, if anyone's going to come on to give public comment, yeah. So while we're working on those folks that are interested in giving public comment, I will read, read, read the, uh, the document that says, uh, public comment at budget meetings. The Silver Falls School District Budget Committee encourages public comment in order to make better informed decisions. The expedite public comment and uh, to expedite public comment and make judicious use of time, the following practices are strongly encouraged. Contact the district superintendent at least one week prior to the meeting and ask to be placed on the agenda. Give the superintendent as much detail as possible about your comments, including any written information so that background information can be developed for budget committee consideration prior to the meeting. The Silver Falls School District Budget Committee has established the following guidelines to accommodate public testimony. One, obtain recognition from the chair before speaking. Two, give testimony from the designated, from the 
designated place. Three, comments concise, keep comments concise and avoid repetition. Four, be specific about what it is you want the budget committee to do. Five, what you are encouraged, sorry, five, you are encouraged to provide each budget committee member with written copies of your testimony. Six, in order to accommodate all who want to speak, please limit your comments to three minutes uh, and we can make a timer uh, for that and I will be the timer. Seven, a group appearing on the same topic is asked to designate a primary speaker and may be granted five minutes. Thank you, that was very pixelated on my screen. So hopefully that was clear. Um, but if there are now people that would like to be promoted and able to speak, we will welcome them. And uh, we will ask uh, and recognize them individually uh, for their testimony. And um, there are so. So we have a couple of comments. I'm gonna promote Ray Kayser and then Melissa Briggs. Okay. So uh, I, I guess uh, I will say, I guess I will, uh, Ray Kayser. Uh, Ray, uh, you're recognized and you have um, three minutes and I will give you a, a, a 30 second uh, notification uh, for time for your comment. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, Ray, you are. Okay. Well, I don't, I can't see anything except my name. Okay, fine. Um, uh, I, I wrote the question, of course, but let's, so let me make a comment. I'm, I would assume, based upon Leslie's uh, presentation about establishing a common curriculum uniform throughout the district, that some areas of study, such as music, art, maybe even schools, that, uh, maybe even science, where you can't uh, have a full-time teacher in every building, that those teachers would be roving. And, um, and so I'm just curious about how that is folded into the budget. I, I noted that the district is picking up uh, district-wide the, the substitute teacher cost. It would seem to me that this sort of activity would also be a district uh, funded cost. And so that's, uh, that's my comment and a kind of a question as well. Thank you. And thank you, Ray, for your comments. And we have um, Melissa that has a, a public comment. Yep, she's coming in now. Thank you. Um, so I just had a couple of questions. I was looking at the um, the school sheets, um, the breakdowns of the, of the different schools, and the Mark Twain and Robert Frost ones didn't make sense to me because R Mark Twain has four kindergarten teachers, and that it's supposed to be a smaller school than Robert Frost, who only has three kindergarten teachers, and I think there was like Mark Twain had one fourth grade teacher for 40 students and that seemed so the numbers just looked a little odd on Mark Twain but I was very excited to see that both schools are going to have a halftime music teacher so that's excellent that we're going to get them to be equal and music at Mark Twain so um, just thought maybe there was a mistake in in the numbers with the teachers I don't know thank you Melissa So I don't believe it's a practice to, to follow up on the questions um, and, and provide answers. Um, but if any of the administration would like to follow up, I, I feel it's appropriate. Um, and yeah, I'll, say, uh, uh, I'll take a closer look at the Mark Twain, Robert Frost uh, sheets with Leslie. They may not completely match up with how she had things uh, planned. I didn't have time to do a final review with her on, on that. I know we're, we're taking a bit of a guesswork as to where uh, certain kids are going to land in certain grades with these new configurations for sure. We do expect uh, both the total of both schools to be less than um, even without the pandemic actually to be less total than where they were um, previously. Um, they were already seeing a bit of a drop They had a couple of bigger classes or all through Robert Frost. But yeah, we'll take a, a closer look at that. And Leslie, 
I know she probably has all these the, the staffing memorized on, on that um, and maybe even be able to talk to the music part that, that Ray brought up as well. So yeah, I think that we had um, Mark Twain at about two teachers per grade level. And if that's not correct on the sheet, then Steve and I will work on that. And uh, Robert Frost was at about three teachers per grade level. Um, we do have several of those potential openings at both schools that we are not filling at this point, waiting on enrollment numbers. Um, and as far as roving teachers or specialists, um, those are costs. If we are sharing staff that are assigned at multiple schools, um, we do um, make sure we fund that. And that's part of, uh, I talked a little bit about the reconfiguration with Mark Twain and Robert Frost. We are um, assigning math and reading intervention licensed teachers to Mark Twain so that they, that is equal at both schools. Um, Robert Frost had that and now, and, and it's the same with music. Melissa, you brought up, we're doing a 0.5 music um, teacher at both schools. And thank you, um, Steve and Leslie for following up on those comments. So I guess that moves us on uh, into the, uh, the next part, if there's no more public comment um, or uh, general questions and discussion from the budget committee. Um, it'd be a good time if... Uh, I have a question, um, but I, I see that Director McLaughlin also has her hand up. I'm not sure if that's from something earlier, or if she has a current question. I don't have it on mine. Go back well. to this. I did raise my hand, but I also noticed that McCole has her hand up as well. So, um, McCole, if you would like to go first, you go right ahead. Mine can wait. Thank you. Thank Mary. you. I'm, I'm, I'm again, my screen is small here. So, I don't have my hand up. Go ahead, McCole. I don't have my hand up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, it looked like you had a hand up on yours. Um, I guess my question too would probably be directed to Ms. Roach and it is concerning, I wanna make sure that I'm not on mute. Um, I wanted to ask, and this, uh, this may be still in the works, but when, um, and I believe I mentioned this to Scott, there was quite a bit of funding for summer school um, due to COVID. Um, and now it seems like additional, but I know that our school district is very good about making sure that we have money for different opportunities. When there is more money provided in an already established program, where does that extra money go? Does it just sort of stay in savings um, or is it, does it go into another folder or fund? Um, I don't know if Leslie or Steve has an answer to that question, but I've always wondered about that, especially after this year with all the challenges. Um, let, me, let me make sure that I understand your question, Lori. So you're, you, know, you know we've offered summer school in the past and yes. that's been funded through Measure 98 High School Success. Um, Correct. Funds. So now that we have extra summer school funding, you're asking, what are we, are we gonna spend all of it or are we gonna save some of it? Is that what you're asking? Or is it going to go towards um, maybe specialty instructors or classes that will benefit our students? How does that work? Yeah, I think Steve could probably answer the technical question about saving the money or what, what we can do with that. I know that the state specifically has told us that they have allocated this much money to us for the grant for summer school. And we are expected to match 25% of the funds okay. that they are giving us with our, with our own funds. And so I'm not sure um, if we will end up spending all of the money that the state is allocating towards summer school for our district. Um, we don't have that many details yet about what the cost will be oh. or what we're offering. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay, just, well, thank um, you. 
add to that um, this new statewide uh, summer school money. Um, again, it's just just over a million dollars, and then we have to um, match twenty five percent. Specifically, it's it's broken out as uh, five hundred seventeen thousand dollars for high school level, and okay. five hundred just under 541,000 for K-8 level. Again, that's not including the 25% the match part. Um, I think they may front a little bit of that money, but essentially um, most grants, um, especially federal grants, title yeah. grants, even the ESSER funds are, we claim the money in arrears, meaning that we spend the money first and then we ask for reimbursement. Um, uh and so, um, SIA, for example, they fronted some money this year, but that's pretty rare and they might front a little bit of the summer school money, but essentially this is a very short window of time. I think what mid to late June through, uh, end of August or, or first of September that this statewide summer school money of over a million dollars takes place and it's a use it or lose it situation. It isn't like we will, uh, be funded that uh much. And then just, you know, whatever we don't use, we could repurpose. Um, however, if, if um, we, since we did use previously measure $98, at least some measure $98 for summer school, which would have been for grades eight through 12 uh, in the past few years, um, we may use some of our match dollars for that since we already had it planned to help for summer school, but maybe in this particular case, we do end up using less of our planned measure 98 expenditures for summer school because of this additional help. Again, we don't get all that money up front, but we have all of next year to spend measure 98 dollars and there's a lot of different ways for that to be spent. So it could open up opportunities to spend some of those measure 98 dollars in some in some different ways. Uh, because oh. we, we received more summer school support this year, for example. Wow. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, next hand up, uh, Jacob, you want to uh, ask a question? Sure. I had a couple of questions and may maybe a comment that was relevant. Um, there was some uh, discussion during public comment about uh, 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 money allocated to Robert Frost or Mark Twain and, and vice versa. And if my understanding is correct, the, the role of the budget committee is that we will approve the bottom line budget. Um, and so I just, I want to be, I want to make sure that I understand correctly that, you know, the budget committee is not necessarily getting involved in, um, uh, you know, looking at every single individual line item within the budget. I, I think that our role is to look at, you know, what is the bottom line? What is the uh, allocation? What is the, you know, uh, anticipated expenditure? Uh, and it, it, my so that was my question, um, and I'm sure either Steve or Scott or Dan can address that. But uh, in addition to that, um, uh, a comment is uh, just in relation to the ESSER funds. Um, my understanding there, from you know my own experience, and. Uh, you know, what I'm doing with, within my own agency is that we are, we are reallocating uh, funds as they are appropriate towards the end of the fiscal years. And, you know, and so the, the, the terminology that we use is that we're trying to save our general fund, you know, so we're looking at things that, you know, we had allocated towards general fund and maybe then we can later on look at this and say okay well this is something that we can reallocate towards ESSER funds and save our general fund and increase our ending fund balance so that we can carry forward for our next year and um 
you know, lessen that impact of any sort of economic uh, heart heartache that we would be feeling in future years. It, is that a it, yeah. is that something that I see Steve? Yeah, I, mean, not, I, I, I think that's is, another, that you know, sense. Uh, is another good good way to put it. Yeah, we're 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 trying to. We're, we're, we're trying to, to, I mean, again, you know, it is hard to determine exactly where everything's going to go as we sit here today, but as we go through the year, um, you know, so many things will become more known to us. And, and ultimately, yes, uh, the, the, this is similar to the Great Recession uh, between 2008 and 2012, um, where they, they, uh, the, the federal government uh, came out with the, uh, I believe it was called the ARA uh, funds, and, uh, and, and, uh, Oregon um, school districts in the state of, of Oregon became dependent on the federal funds at that point in time to help stabilize and, and, and ride out the rough waves during that time. This is this is this is very similar um, to to that with these uh, stimulus plans and the, and the related ESSER funds. So so that is is very true. In fact, um, for both ESSER two and ESSER three dollars um, on that side by side sheet, one of the one of the uses says specifically other activities necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services and local educational agencies and continuing to employ existing staff. And that's the type of thing, one of the things that we talked about. Uh, again, there's other other pot potential uses that we have planned as well, but but that's uh, that's a good way to, you know, to sum that up, uh, Jacob. Thank you, Steve. And then next up for a comment is Matt. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, I'll keep it quick. There's uh, two schools that have contingency reserve funds on the school profiles. Um, and especially if, if we're budgeting based on ADM, I'm just curious why money is allocated to two particular schools and not the rest. Yeah. Uh, great question, Matt. Um, that's also something that's going kind of by the wayside, if, if you will. Um, discretionary funds have been allowed, again, the non-staffing, primary staffing part of the budget, discretionary funds left over in years past were allowed to be you know, carried over at 100%. And some, there were a few schools that built up, built, built up over the years. Um, and again, um, we're, 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 we're getting away from that. And, and Victor Point is actually one of the schools that had a higher balance. and. Um, Couple of years ago, they were instructed that you know they needed to get that spent down, and they used um, most of that on their covered play uh, structure. So, um, so this the school specific carryover has decreased quite a bit over the years, and I believe that there's I think there should be an exercise with um, you know the board to um, to create a policy around a school carryover that you know. You know, maybe it's you know you can you can keep up to, you know, fifteen percent or ten percent of whatever your discretionary because it is hard to hit it right on the nose in terms of the the spending. Most most schools spend all of it, but sometimes there are situations that occur that um, that a school might have a timing issue or something like that. And so I think there needs to be some more you know a continuity with with that um, in terms of the the discretionary funds. But that's something that that actually has been addressed and. Um, we've we've started to get away from. Thanks. So giving it um, a brief scroll, um, questions and discussion. Well, I'll, I'll chime in. I um, had two thoughts, uh, follow-up thoughts on a couple of comments. Uh, one regarding the, uh, the carryover, that's not really allocated so much as it's carried over, right? So it's not like those schools are getting allocated money for that fund. They still have that fund and it was reserved from a prior year or maybe many prior years of carryover. Do I have that right, Steve? Yeah, it was from previous years, yeah. Yeah. 
not not fresh allocation. Right. Uh, the second uh, comment was to piggyback on something Jacob alluded to earlier, which I just wanted to make sure you know he. He sort of asked the question, but it didn't get answered. And I want to make sure Steve, you or you, Scott, have a chance to address his question regarding, you know, to what level of detail is this committee uh, charted with, with digging into? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, um, it was mentioned earlier, and I think it's covered in the roles and responsibilities that. You know the committee really doesn't you know have a control control over the 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 union contracts or employment contracts or specific level of, of staffing but you know i would expect that any any question on any of these 80 some pages is fair game for me now um, i know meetings get laid and some questions could just be simply uh, asked offline um, you know de detailed questions that uh, we would capture in the Q&A document and make sure it's shared with, with everyone, including the public on the next board book agenda. And um, that's great. Um, and there's been a lot of great questions, you know, asked ask tonight. Um, and I know the school situation, um, you know, I think there's uh, specifically Mark Twain and Robert Frost, you know, there's a significant change going on there. So I think it lends itself to some more discussion this year, especially. Jonathan, thank you for answering for asking that follow up question. Um, I, I think that in a situation where you know we've got some significant realignment between grades and the two schools, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, when we did the same exercise between uh, the realignment where we sent, uh, gosh, what was it, Eugene Field K through two up to Mark Twain and then the kids from Mark Twain over to Robert Frost. Um, and Leslie, I think you were the principal over there, Robert Frost. There, there, was, some, there was some significant budget unknowns um, in that process. Um, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect there to be an incredible amount of granularity uh, in this uh, budget with that uh with that level of you know with with those unknowns you know we don't know what we don't know uh there's there's things that are going to come up that we don't anticipate that the administration can't possibly anticipate and uh you know and, and so that's why i'm saying i i think that it, it's our role to really look at the bottom line um, you know, if, if there's some gross error in one of the higher lines that we see, then certainly we bring that up. But uh, I think that our role is to look at the bottom line and ultimately decide on what that number is. So are there any more comments, uh, discussion items that we want to? There's two more out? hands. Yeah, Peter, there are two more. Hands. Jennifer, there we go. Janet, let's just start at the top, or do you want to go in order? Uh, Jennifer? I think Shelly was first, Shelley? but I could be wrong. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Shelly? Actually, Jennifer was first. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> OK. Um, you know, I, um, I want to thank uh, Steve for his explanation. I think um, this particular budget season is exceptionally uh, uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, not only do we have some changes happening with K-5, which I think are valid questions um, from our public and from anybody on this committee uh, to really ask those questions. Um, and also the pandemic. You know, we, we have, you know, less students in our district. We don't know what money's coming and what the changes are. Things are changing every day. Um, so, you know, we do look at the bottom line, but um, I would have to disagree with Jacob at this point. 
um, and say that I think all of these questions are valid. Um, and this has been the best discussion of budget committee I've ever been on. Um, and I do appreciate everybody's efforts um, and, and very critical thinking questions that have helped enhance um, you know, more uh, transparency for our district. So um, all kinds of questions and unknowns, but I wanna, I wanna thank them for, for doing the job and, uh, and answering those questions for us. And that's really important. So thank you. Thanks, Shelley and Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to um, thank the clarity around um, our role because I think that it is important to know practically what our role is. And I also think it's important that we are able to be ambassadors to the community about how the district spends money. And if, um, you know, if there has to be a balance, right? We don't want to have a meeting that lasts four hours. Um, and I think there's also, you know, in my opinion, room to get questions answered so that we can justify the decisions that are made. Um, like I see myself as if I can't answer the question, then I haven't done my job. I need to go ask the question so that I can answer them. So I just wanted to, um, you know, say that I see a place for, for both of those things, but we have to keep balance. Thanks, Jennifer. And on that, it looks, I'm gonna keep going up and down the, the list, but um, yeah, I guess um, a, a couple of comments that I just wanna make, or maybe just to figure out where to go from here and, and, and and to respond back to you know what is the role? Um, I think our role uh, is outlined pretty clearly in the documents that we, we've been given, and, and we can question some of the the budget lines. But um, really, I guess I want to go through is is how we're going to move forward because that's the next step. And and questions that we have as a committee, and maybe this would go to Dan um, and Scott just so we can make sure we're clear because. Uh, this happened with a long range facility planning committee, but um, how do we go about individually, um, just so we're making sure we're all on the same page, asking any questions. If a person on this committee, not on the school board, but on, on the appointed committee portion, um, you know, how do we go about asking a question and what would you like us to do? And let's make that kind of that norm for how we're gonna ask questions. Are we going to direct them to the, the chair and that chair can, myself communicates uh, with McColl, because we're co-chairs in a way, um, or, or how, how are we going to address questions from this group going forward? That would be my first question that I want uh, clarification on, just so we're all on the same page. And just so the other committee members know that Peter's referencing public record, uh, public meeting law rules, and just making sure we're on the up and up there, just so people understand the context of of that. And um, it, I'm going to maybe ask Steve, you know, you've had some different uh, share outs to help facilitate people's questions. I don't know if you had a particular suggestion related to how you have fielded questions from committee members in the past that you think can work. I, I think Peter's suggestion of him and McColl maybe fielding questions and then bring him forward might be a good model, I, I think that could work, but I just wanted to see what's worked for you in the past, Steve. Yeah, um, I, I think that could be a good way to do it, um, you know, because there's nothing wrong with an individual member asking a, a question and they and, and, and they're, it's fine to come, you know, to me. Uh, I just, it just, uh, any question that's asked um, needs to be shared and the answer shared with the entire group and the public. So that's the key. And so, um, but instead of kind of, uh, you know, answering a few questions each day for a week and a half, um, I think the best way to do this would be to say, um, we have our next meeting in two weeks. And so uh, if we could uh, take maybe two batches, um, 
between now and next Wednesday, for example, and then we could get by uh, next Thursday or Friday uh, answers to the first round of questions that came, and then also make sure that the questions are posted on the uh, next uh, meeting agenda. Um, and if we do a second round before that next meeting, that would also be the case. But we could share out to the group the answers, get it posted on the board book agenda, uh, you know, between meeting questions and answers. And those questions and answers would also get published in the adopted budget document. So they would live on forever. So would those questions get posed to you or would you want those yeah. sent to Peter and McColl? I'm open to either. I don't, I don't want to create an extra step if, if unless if they would like to uh, have the questions come to them, that's totally fine with me. But uh, I, I'm, I'm going to quickly say, uh, Steve, if you would be the fielding of questions sure. um, and I'm then disseminate to. which ones it, you feel yeah. to distribute mm -hmm. to McCall or myself or the, the entire group uh, as you see needed. I just wanted to make sure we had uh, yeah. folks that have questions from this group or even the public. Steve, mm -hmm. are you indicating that you want to yeah. be the point person? Yes. And, and so Just, that's, uh, that would I, be great. I, and I won't answer those one-on-one uh, -on -one while they individually come in. I'll save it up for three or four days, get them all together, answer them all at once out to the group, and also then we'll get it posted as well. And, and so that goes out to anyone that's listening in on the, on the public side of, of this meeting, outside of our, our kind of visual faces here. But yeah, anyone that's listening in, um, send your questions and comments to Steve, and, and he will share and disseminate appropriately. Yeah. And, and some of those questions are probably just pretty easy, um, straightforward answers. And then other ones could be a good uh, items that, 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 that end up uh, surfacing as uh, good discussion points for the next meeting as well. Yeah, so, so, so thank you uh, for that clarification and, and uh, appointment <laughs> of questions. But the, the last piece that I would just like to throw out to the the, the group uh, committee to see if we can maybe add this in is, can we have a, another public comment earlier in the meeting? Um, nine o'clock is when I called the public comment at 9.07 we return. That's two hours in and, I, and we've had some great discussion tonight and there'll be some information. Some folks have been watching and listening in or they'll, they'll, they'll follow up on the recorded um, audio or video. But it'd be really great if we could, in our future budget uh, meetings, um, have a public comment earlier. Um, may, not right at the absolute beginning, but maybe if, if we keep with the same kind of agenda, I'm looking at that really quickly, but um, you know, after we have kind of a, a general overview from, from uh, Scott about the we'll probably have a kind of a common theme that you'll want to address, Scott. Uh, maybe we could have some public comments. It just gives, that, I doubt there will be a lot of people, but it just gives them an opportunity to yeah, come earlier. I agree, Peter. I think it, it'd be right in line with the practice we have for board meetings as well. We could build in, a, in another uh, public comment uh, and have one towards the beginning and then one, one towards the end. If that so I don't, I don't know if we need to put that towards a, a motion or if we just have consensus. If there's any, any. You're, you're going to set the agenda, Peter. So we don't really need to have. It. I mean, we can all talk about it, but really, you, you're going to set the agenda, so you can certainly do that. Yeah, we could do that. I, I want to make sure we're all we're all okay, and then that's. Yeah. I don't want to. So unless someone gives me a big old thumbs down, then I think we'll we'll add that in and. Let the public know that there is going to be a time within hopefully the first 30 minutes of this meeting where they're allowed to step away yeah. from their family and zoom on in, uh, literally, and hopefully not physically, but yeah. Um, so, okay. So we'll work that in for those that are listening. Um, we'll try to get your public comments a little earlier, but that's uh, that's been a request several times. So um, outside of that, I'm looking back at I keep losing the agenda on my computer, but uh, I guess we're at the end. So uh, we need to obviously establish the next meeting date that's been on the calendar. Uh, I'm assuming, and not really assuming anything, but uh, I need a motion to either um, 
hold another meeting or, or, or move on. Um, I, I'm kind of at a, an end of uh, the, the future business and discussion. So I need to entertain a motion to, to extend this meeting to a, another date We're not, uh, or, or vote on the budget. So what's, uh, what say you? Peter, I'll, go, I'll make a motion to uh, continue the meeting on, what is it, May 20th? I think is the, is the date that's on our calendar currently. Um, to continue this meeting for further discussion and potential action item. Okay, so Jacob has a motion to uh, send the meeting to uh, the appropriate date as stated. Your second. I have a question um, really quick. Um, the end of the motion was to have a potential action item. Um, I'm not really comfortable with that yet. Are we just having two meetings? Budget I, I, meetings? So I didn't, I, I, I guess I only heard the, we could reread the motion or restate the motion then. So in, uh, so this is my, this is my sixth year on budget committee and in this, five previous years, we have uh, approved a budget after the second meeting. Um, so, I mean, I, what I said was potentially we would uh, approve a budget. If at the end of the second meeting, if we're not ready to approve a budget yet, then certainly we can move it to a third meeting. Last year was the first year that in, in my memory that we needed a third meeting. So. Uh, that's what I'm so, saying. If we so, we, 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 so Jacob, just to get not. this, uh, we have a motion. Um, we don't have a second. Do we want to amend the, 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 the motion? Um, we don't have a second, so we're going to go back and redo a motion. I'll second it. I'll, I'll second it, Peter. Okay, so Jacob has a motion to ex extend the meeting to May... Pardon me. For the not 20th, I believe, is the 20th. date. The um, and you want to continue that just to repeat what you said, Jacob? Sure. My motion is to continue this meeting to May 20th to potentially accept the budget for that day. Or if we need to have a third meeting, then we can discuss a further meeting. But the second meeting would be May 20th for potential approval of the budget. So, so thank, thank you for the clarification that goes to, to Shelley's, but so we have, a, we have a clarification on the motion. Uh, Tom, as a second, is there discussion? I think for clarity, we should just um, say that we'd like to make a motion to return May 20th to continue. And then we can decide at that time if we may need another meeting or if we are ready to approve. It's a very interesting year that we're in. And I think for clarity, it would be nice to streamline the motion. Just for a parliamentary uh, clarification here, I believe that when we put it on the, on the agenda that we need to uh, have an action item if there's a potential that we will approve the budget on May 20th. If there's, if there's any potential that we can approve the budget on May 20th, it needs to be on the agenda. I believe Jacob's right regarding that. I don't think you could hold the meeting without a potential action item and then decide at the end you were going to approve the budget. So. <clears throat> So continuing on that discussion is uh, uh, Jennifer, you're, I saw I saw some saw a line on your never mind. Um, yeah, I just but I, I think um, whatever happens, there's got to be a vote on this motion because it was seconded. So I just want to the discussion can continue until the question is called, but we've got to vote on that motion. Yep, I, I, I agree on that. So we're we're continuing on the discussion. So. Um, any more discussion on the motion at hand? Just to add on here, 
I mean, I, I, I don't see the harm in approving a motion to put an agenda item on the next meeting to potentially vote on the budget. If we're all satisfied that we have a budget, then certainly we can all vote on it. If we get to that meeting and we decide that there is some some item or some thing that is pre preventing us from approving the budget, then we can certainly remove that action item and move it to a next meeting. But I mean, it, it's just a, a procedural thing. Yeah, I, and I'm not trying to agree or disagree. I'm just I'm, I just want the discussion to right. ensue. I, I understand, Peter. I'm just I'm just trying to add some clarification. Yeah. No, I and, and I appreciate and I, that that for me, I'll, I'll comment on and discuss myself that that clarification helps me, um, because if it is an action item, it, it is basically that that we we can independently, individually decide. So I I, I don't have any more uh, comment there, but I think that's clarification enough. So. Um, we just need a call of the question. Question. The question has been called. Um, and do we want, uh, can we have someone other than Jacob or myself reread the question? So we can have it recorded properly. Or Jacob, you could restate it again for the record. Just sure. So we have it. So the, the motion that I've called is that we continue the meeting to May 20th with an agenda item to, uh, with an action item to approve the budget as proposed. That is the motion, the question's been called. Let's uh, roll call. Jacob. Oh, I guess I have to do that. I'll do it in order. Sorry, I thought we had um, go down the list. Um, I must go down my list in no, no particular order. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Shelly? Shelly? I uh, don't hear Shelly. Uh, Tom? Aye. Aye. Lori? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Astrid? Hi. They're bouncing around. Um, Kurt? Uh, yes. Uh, Janet? Yes. And, and if I have Nicole? Yes. I apologize that your, your names are all mixing up on me for some reason. Um, Jacob? Yes. Yeah, he did. Jonathan? Yes. And, and then again, uh, I apologize. Who did I forget to call outside myself? I'm going to go yes, but who, who did I not call on because the... I didn't hear my name. Not yet. Shall I? Yes. What was... The... Uh, yes. Okay. So I, I, it's I unanimous. Think... Did you call on Robin or Matt? Oh, my... Sorry, Robin. Okay, I said yes. I thought I did. Yeah, your names are bouncing around. Robin and Matt. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So it's unanimous. It, it was it was a technicality, but thank you for that that uh, clarification. So, um, with that, I think um, there is no more business or discussion. Uh, I move to adjourn. Second. And the call is seconded. And we are good to go. Thank you, Peter. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much.